Good afternoon. Welcome to the Private Wealth Management in Hong Kong, the best option webinar, co-organized by the Departments of Justice, the Financial Services and the Treasury Bureau, and Invest Hong Kong. My name is Kaka Lam. It's my pleasure to be your MC today. On behalf of the organizers, I'd like to extend the warmest welcome to all the guests. In this webinar, speakers from different areas of expertise will participate in two panel discussions. The discussions will cover topics on regulation and tax regime of Hong Kong's private wealth management industry, the perspectives from family offices in Hong Kong, and the legal services that could facilitate private wealth management in Hong Kong. To begin with, Please welcome the Honorable Ms. Teresa Cheng Yuk Wa, GBM GBS SCJP, Secretary for Justice of the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region, to give an opening remarks. Secretary for Justice, please. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Thank you for joining this webinar organized by the Financial Services and Treasury Bureau, Invest Hong Kong, and the Department of Justice. With Hong Kong's close connectivity with China and the world, our sound and mature legal system, and a sophisticated and experienced financial industry, the family office business has flourished in recent years. To further enhance Hong Kong's attractiveness to family office, Invest Hong Kong has created a dedicated unit to help family office to settle in Hong Kong. The topic of resolution of disputes in private wealth management was explored in a panel discussion in the Mediate First Pledge event organized by our department in May this year. There was a discussion about family constitution, which is akin to a commercial contract, for governing relationship of the family members, deciding how family businesses are to operate, as well as distributing family wealth, so as to ensure family culture and spirits are passed down to the next generations. Some family constitutions provide a dispute resolution mechanism. To this end, one of the speakers recommended that a mediate first clause be included in the family constitution. Mediation is ideal for resolving family disputes for two major reasons. First, mediation is confidential. Ultra high net worth families would likely prefer to have their disputes settle privately and confidentially, so as to avoid any unnecessary public and media attention. Another aspect is that mediation allows the parties to identify and focus on the common goal and to derive creative solution to resolve their own unique set of problems. Ms. Shalin Chen, who will also be speaking to you later in this webinar, shared a very successful and touching story of using mediation to resolve family disputes involving the financial arrangement of a mentally incapacitated mother. We'll learn from the story that after the mediation, the parties were able to focus on the common goal, which was to look after the best interests of the mother, and they generated creative options to settle the claims which involved drafting up a family constitution to define the ownership of the assets and the management responsibilities of the family businesses. A win-win situation has been achieved through mediation, which allows parties to preserve relationship and continue to work together after resolution of the disputes. Arbitration is another viable option for parties involved in private wealth management disputes. In particular, disputes related to investment and financial products arising in the context of private wealth planning may be resolved by arbitration in a timely and confidential manner and resulting in a final and binding resolution of the dispute. 
electronic mediation and arbitration have been developing quickly in recent years, in particular during the COVID-19 pandemic. Talking about this, one cannot miss mentioning the Ibrem International Online Dispute Resolution Center of Hong Kong. Ibrem provides an efficient, cost-effective, and secure platform for online deal-making and resolving disputes among parties in any part of the world. Parties in wealth-related disputes may be located in different geographic, lo lo uh, geographic areas, and in view of the travel restrictions imposed by different countries now, the online dispute resolution services offered by Ibrahim in Hong Kong will be the ideal platform to resolve private world disputes. A mechanism comprised of mediate first, arbitrate next can be easily and best administered by a one-stop shop platform providing ease and confidence to the parties. The panel discussion on private wealth in our Mediate First Pledge event I mentioned earlier was a great success. This gets me to think how we can further enhance Hong Kong's position as the international legal and financial hub by ticking on the opportunities that can be offered by the Greater Bay Area. It is worthy to note that the GBA contributes to the strong wealth growth momentum in China with more than 84,000 ultra high net worth families in China representing an increase by around 20% over the past three years. More than 19,300 of these families are in the Greater Bay Area which is around 20% of the total in the whole of China. With the cross-boundary wealth management connect scheme in the GBA area just launched in September 21, which allows eligible mainland Hong Kong and Macau residents in the GBA to invest in wealth management products distributed by banks in each other's markets through a closed loop funds flow channel, established between their respective banking systems. The connection between Hong Kong and the GBA will further strengthen the demand for cross-boundary wealth management and investment services from GBA residents will increase. Against these backgrounds, Invest Hong Kong, the Financial Services and Treasury Bureau, and the Department of Justice decided to team up to organize a webinar to give audience from around the world a comprehensive discussion of why Hong Kong is the best option to manage private wealth. Today's webinar is entitled, Private Wealth Management in Hong Kong, The Best Option. Hong Kong is no doubt reinforcing its strength to attract, to attract private wealth from around the globe. Hong Kong's assets under management reached 34.9 trillion in 2020, and 64% of which came from non-Hong Kong investors. This is unequivocal evidence showing Hong Kong's status as a leading global financial center. Hong Kong's success relies heavily on our unique one country, two systems, our stable and secured financial market, and our sound and robust legal system. All these factors make Hong Kong the best option for managing private wealth. In today's webinar, you will hear the latest policy initiatives by the Hong Kong government relating to private wealth. In this regard, I trust the Under Secretary for Financial Services and the Tre Treasury, who will also be giving the opening remarks together with the key industry players in this field, will provide you with some very useful and practical insights. The second part of the webinar will showcase the full spectrum of legal and dispute resolution services Hong Kong has to offer to support private wealth management. The legal and dispute resolution sector in Hong Kong provides high quality services to facilitate deal making and resolving disputes, as well as in taking care of the regulatory and legal compliance side for private wealth management related matters. The speakers are all experienced and respectable leaders in Hong Kong's legal and dispute resolution sector 
who will share with you their first-hand experience on why Hong Kong is the best option to manage private wealth. Managing private wealth in Hong Kong is definitely the best option. We have the sound legal and financial infrastructures. In addition, we have been given various unparalleled opportunities under one country, two systems, such as the Closer Economic Partnership Agreement, the National 14th Five-Year Plan, the Greater Bay Area Outline Development Plan, and the Tianhai Plan. But above all, we have an immense wealth of talent from around the world, all converging in Hong Kong. Against this background, I'm sure Hong Kong's private wealth management and legal sector will continue to thrive. On this note, I wish this webinar a great success. Thank you very much. Thank you, Secretary for Justice. Please be seated. Next, let us welcome Mr. Joseph Chen, JP, Under Secretary for Financial Services and the Treasury to give an opening remarks. Joseph, please. Distinguished speakers and guests, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to speak to you today at today's uh, webinar. It is the very first time that the Department of Justice Financial Services and the Treasury Bureau, and Invest Hong Kong jointly organized such a webinar. And I'm glad to note that hundreds of participants from different locations are joining us today. The title of today's webinar is Private Wealth Management in Hong Kong, the Best Option. Just last month, the Global Financial Centers Index published its latest rankings, where Hong Kong ranked first in Asia and third in the world only behind New York and London. In infrastructure, human capital, financial sector development, reputation and more, Hong Kong remains among the world's most sought after financial centers. Indeed, Hong Kong is Asia's leading international financial center, topping various league tables for the region. In equities, Hong Kong ranked number two in the world and number one in Asia in terms of funds raised through IPO in 2020. And Hong Kong has ranked number one in the world for seven times in the past 12 years in this regard. Last year, Hong Kong's equities market average daily turnover reached 129.5 billion Hong Kong dollars, up by 49% over 2019. In the bond market, Hong Kong was the largest center for arranging Asian international bond issuance in 2020. Hong Kong was also Asia's largest center for arranging first-time bond issuance last year. In the insurance market, Hong Kong insurance density ranked number two in the world and number one in Asia. For the wealth and asset management business, at the end of last year, Hong Kong Asset Under Management, AUM, rose 21% year-on-year -year to 4.5 trillion US dollars. According to a BCG report released in June this year, as a cross-border wealth center by AUM, Hong Kong ranked number two in the world and number one in Asia in 2020. And this same report predicted that Hong Kong would take over the world's number one position in 2023 with strong inflows from the mainland to further drive our AUM up in coming years. The Hong Kong SL government is committed to developing the wealth and asset management business, and we have launched a series of measures for market development. Last August, we launched the Limited Partnership Fund regime, boosting Hong Kong's status as an international asset and fund management center. More than 300 funds have already registered under this new regime in the first year. And in April this year, we passed legislation offering tax concessions for carried interests of private equity and venture capital funds. And just last month, we also passed legislation creating a mechanism to help foreign fund redomicile here in Hong Kong. When it comes to private wealth management uh, decisions, tax is a very important consideration. In Hong Kong, there is no capital gain tax, no dividend withholding, and no estate duty. For fund structures, 
be that publicly or privately offered, onshore or offshore setup, they all enjoy profit tax exemption. In fact, Hong Kong ranked number two in the world in terms of ease of paying taxes in 2020, according to a study by the World Bank Group and PwC. Well, private wealth management business is a people's business after all. And the Hong Kong SL government attaches great importance to, talent, to talent's development in this arena. We launched the pilot program to enhance talent training for the asset and wealth management sector in 2016. Over the years, this program has implemented a series of initiatives, including financial incentive scheme for professional training, promotion and education, and internship program to enhance talent promotion and training to meet the growing needs of the wealth and asset management sector. In 2017, the University of Hong Kong rolled out the Bachelor of Finance in Asset Management and Private Banking, which grooms local talents for businesses in this sector. And to attract global talents to come to Hong Kong, asset management professionals, including experienced investment consultants, are covered under our talent list, where qualified talents can enjoy immigration facilitation under the Quality Migrant Admission Scheme. Hong Kong is Asia's billionaire city and second only to New York globally. Last year, Hong Kong recorded the largest net increase of billionaires among the world cities. The accumulation of wealth in Hong Kong and Asia generally, coupled with the trend to service customization, is encouraging more diversified wealth management services, including family offices. Invest Hong Kong launched Family Office HK this year, a dedicated and experienced team centered right here in this office with professionals in Beijing, Guangzhou, and Brussels, will extend its reach and its offerings internationally. Together, they will prove indispensable to family offices in their planning, management, and expansion, and as in their communication with regulators, government departments, relevant professional associations, and other critical stakeholders. They will, in short, champion Hong Kong as Asia's family office hub. Our financial regulators have been equally supportive with the Securities and Futures Commission and the Hong Kong Monetary Authority clarifying regulatory requirements for family offices. Among other things, that means that a single family office, one serving only its group companies, does not need a license from the SFC. In addition, as mentioned by the chief executive in the 2021 policy address, we are currently reviewing tax treatment to enhance Hong Kong's attractiveness as a family office hub. I'm also pleased to note that our country's 14th five-year plan underlines Hong Kong's status as an international financial capital, global offshore renminbi business hub, and International Asset Management and Risk Management Center. The plan recognizes, too, the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area development. Measures to enhance connectivity among the area's 11 cities will give Hong Kong a clear advantage in expanding our private wealth management and family office sector. The cross-boundary wealth management connect for the area, launched just last month, is a landmark in the development of Hong Kong's wealth management business and the heightened connectivity it creates with mainland markets. Ladies and gentlemen, under one country, two systems, the core competitiveness of Hong Kong includes free flow of capital, free flow of information, our common law legal system with independent judiciary, our transparent and low tax system, and a wealth of international and experienced professionals, including many of you. The government and our regulators will continue to work closely with you to grow Hong Kong as a regional hub for the wealth and asset management business. On this note, I would like to thank all the distinguished speakers for the sharing in the upcoming sessions, and I wish you all the best of health and rewarding webinar today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joseph. Please be seated. It is encouraging to know that the government is providing huge support to the private wealth management sector. 
Now let us start the panel discussion. For panel one, the theme is latest policy initiatives on private wealth management in Hong Kong. Our panelists will discuss Hong Kong's latest policy initiatives relating to private wealth management. We are honored to have invited the following distinguished guests as our panelists. Let us welcome Mr. Jeremy Lam, partner of Deakins and director of the Financial Services Development Council as the moderator. Let's give a big hand to welcome Jeremy. <laughs> Mr. Lam is an active participant in a number of Hong Kong's securities industry associations. He is also an executive committee member of the Alternative Investment Management Association. Let me introduce our first panel one speaker, Mr. Chi Meng Kwan. Mr. Kwan, please. <laughs> Mr. Kwan is the founder and group chief executive officer of Ravos Family Office, one of Asia's largest multifamily offices. In addition to his corporate role, he is also the chairman of Family Office Association Hong Kong. Then let us also welcome Mr. Jin Jin Jiang. Mr. Jiang, please. Mr. Jiang is a partner in the Corporate and Securities Group of King and Wood Medicines in Hong Kong and head of Hong Kong Funds team. He is also the founding president of the Hong Kong LPF Association. Our third speaker, Mr. Rex Ho. Rex, please. Rex is the mainland China and Hong Kong financial services tax leader of PwC. He has over 20 years of experience in providing tax consulting and planning services to a wide range of multinational companies in Hong Kong. Last but not least, let me introduce Mr. Ricky Chan. Ricky, please. Mr. Chan is Managing Director of Credit Suisse and was appointed to the role of Market Group Head Hong Kong in 2016. He has more than two decades of experience in the private banking industry in Hong Kong. Now I'll hand over to Mr. Lam, please. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this afternoon's Panel One discussion. Uh, as we heard in the opening remarks from the Under Secretary for Financial Services and Treasury, uh, Hong Kong remains an international financial center. And what is interesting to note at the moment is that it, the government is very much focused on the wealth management industry and facilitating the growth of this area. So it's a, it's a great opportunity to explain some of that to you this afternoon. So what this panel is going to cover, we're going to look at an overview of Hong Kong's regulatory environment. We're going to look at the tax environment. Uh, we're going to hear some perspectives from a family office. And then we're also going to hear the views of um, sort of private bank about sort of the trends and services. And then hopefully we'll have some time for, for Q&A. So just to start off with the, an overview of the regulatory uh, environment, um, I'd like to ask uh, Jing Jing a few questions. Um, and in order to sort of set the scene, could you just explain to the audience what are some of the sort of the key regulatory developments that, uh, is, that we've seen recently that is relevant to the, the private wealth management industry and really facilitating the, uh, the growth of the industry going forward. So, Jingjing, can you share your thoughts on that, please? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, I think just now the Under Secretary of uh, Joseph Chen has mentioned all the regulated development, actually. Uh, so, um, I would just mention a few that uh, is very relevant to um, the wealth, private wealth management. Um, industry in Hong Kong. So first one is the family office. So the um, the SFC in in January last year, SFC, if you are aware of the issue, a circular to clarify their position on the licensing uh, requirement on family office. So in September, they issue some uh, guidelines again. Um, and I think they stress that it's not the intent of SFC to extend their oversight, a regulatory oversight to, to to genuine single families office. So it means if you are a um, single family office, you don't need to worry about licensing, get licensed in Hong Kong. So that's very good news for people who are thinking about setting up a uh, family office business in Hong Kong. And also the government also take initiative uh, uh, to set up a dedicated team headed by Dixon Wong uh, uh, as a Hong Kong uh, family office Hong Kong uh, to lead this initiative. So we have been working closely with uh, Families Office Hong Kong as well. Um, and as um, the Secretary for Justice just mentioned that, 
uh, in the latest policy address, if you can see that they have mentioned that um, the Hong Kong government is also studying um, the, the uh, tax concession for family business to attract more family business to, 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 to come to Hong Kong. So Rex probably will explain uh, in detail later. And uh, the second area that I need to mention is the private uh, fund structure in Hong Kong. So there are two uh, private fund structure available now for, for, for private equity, for private funds manager. So one is OFC uh, and another one is limited partnership uh, structure. So uh, the, the first one, OFC, was introduced uh, at the end of uh, July 2018. And SFC further relaxed some of the restrictions, including the investment restrictions and uh, the requirement on custodian uh, for private private OFC. So, um, and especially this year in, in May, um, uh, the government also, uh, the SFC also announced the detail of the government grant uh, for those people, for those investment managers who set up OFC in Hong Kong or re-domicile their, the, 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 their offshore fund into Hong Kong as an OFC. Um, each fund manager and each OFC will get a subsidy up to um, $1 million, uh, and one million Hong Kong dollar. And uh, one investment manager can be eligible for those subsidy for like three OFCs. Uh, so I think the introduction, so I just, uh, before we start, we we'll talk to Jeremy just now, I think you can see it's very, ob it's very obvious, like since the introduction of that grant scheme, um, the number of OFC set up in the last five months has just more than doubled. Uh, and we have, I just checked the number of OFC this morning. So we have now 27 OFC set up with a total of around uh, uh, 60 uh, fund and sub fund set up already. Um, and another very uh, successful uh, structure is, of course, Limited Partnership Fund, so which was introduced around a year ago. And we have uh, Today, you can see or already there is uh, 351 LPF set up in Hong Kong. So, and the number is still growing. So we can see like this, this, um, the, this, this, um, re this LPF structure is popular. And I think, uh, as just Joseph just mentioned, the redomicilation uh, scheme was just passed uh, this uh, last month, and it will take effect on the first of November this year. So we think that will further. Uh, uh, attract more funds to uh, locate or relocate their funds in Hong Kong. And the last two uh, regulatory development is also in September. It's one is uh, the uh, the launch of GBA Wealth Connect, and another one is the, the southbound trading of the uh, Bot Connect. So I think all of those regulatory uh, development, I think, will help and it further strengthen Hong Kong's position as a financial center. Yeah. Thanks, Jingjing. And I think it's also interesting to note that as, as part of the regulatory initiative to basically to Hong Kong to make Hong Kong a more attractive venue uh, for the sort of private wealth management industry, also from a cost perspective, because I think what we're seeing is that now that uh, there's an ability to sort of re-domicile offshore funds into Hong Kong, uh, one of the sort of the, the benefits of doing so is obviously the ongoing operational costs, because I think that in years gone by, uh, I think a lot of the industry were looking look, looked at offshore for a number of reasons. One was because it was more tax efficient and also from an ongoing cost perspective. But I think that we're now very much uh, not just on an equal footing, but I think that from a, an ongoing cost perspective, Hong Kong now is a domicile actually is is, uh, is is not just more comp not just competitive but actually it's a it's a better place from a from a cost perspective as well but Jing, 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 I, before I pass over to to Rex to, to talk about a little bit about the tax um, can you just say that in terms of how do you think that Hong Kong is benefiting from increased connectivity with the the mainland I mean this is a sort of an ongoing thing we're seeing it's only going to continue to grow but can you just sort of share a few thoughts as to as to sort of how you w what's happening at the moment and, and the benefit that Hong Kong is is currently reaping and of course will do in future. Yes, I think the um, increasing connectivity between Hong Kong and the mainland. I think uh, I think it's very obvious. I think it's not only physical uh, connectivity because as you can see, I mean, of course, because now it's COVID, you cannot travel easily. But I mean, in Hong Kong, you can get to any major city of mainland China within four hours. Uh, under normal situations, um, and uh, especially in the GBA areas, you can 
getting to Shenzhen, Guangzhou within like one or two hours before. That's physical connectivity. And in the uh, chief executive policy address, um, they said uh, the government is thinking of building up the northern metropolis where with the 300 square kilometers uh, along the line of along the border uh, of Shenzhen. So I think the and they are building like two cities, three circles too, I think uh, with the infrastructure connecting the cities, uh, Hong Kong and, and, and the Shenzhen. So that will further facilitate the consolidation among the GBA cities. Um, and financially speaking, I think as you can see in the last dec in, in, in the past decade, there are a lot of uh, 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 new rules coming out to help Hong Kong um, from like, uh, I think it's a decade ago, the, uh, the uh, RQV uh, was launched to help uh, to grow Hong Kong's IMB um, business. And also in 2014, the launch of uh, Shanghai uh, and Hong Kong Stock Connect. In 2015, it's um, uh, mutual recognition funds between Hong Kong and mainland China. 2016, the, the, the Shenzhen and the Hong Kong Stock Connect. And 2017, the Bot Connect. And now the GPA Wealth Connect. So all those connect, it's like increasing. It means the increasing connectivity between mainland and Hong Kong. And of course, I mean, with the help of those uh, uh, in initiative, you can see, as Joseph just mentioned, right, they, they, you can see the performance of the Hong Kong financial market. Hong Kong now is the world largest equity fundraising center. It's one of the largest the bond market, the third largest in, in, in Asia Pacific, uh, in, in Asia, excluding Japan. And also, um, it's the, 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 the largest IMB bond market. And also, it's um, in terms of private private wealth management, is also the second largest globally and the largest um, in, in 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 Asia. So I think, uh, as you can see, the benefit is very obvious. Without the support of those um, uh, uh, increasing connectivity with mainland China, it's, uh, I don't think that those 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 performance is possible. And in terms of legal area as well, I think we can see uh, the the connectivity is. Uh, uh, it's getting, um, um, I think, the, 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 the pace of those connectivity get faster. Uh, in the last two years, um, you can see that mainland China and Hong Kong um, has um, entered into some mutual assistance or mutual recognition uh, in terms of the, those enforcement of civil judgment, in terms of the, um, the, the uh, insolvency and uh, um, bankruptcy procedure in terms of uh, uh, getting the court ordered interim measures in a in a di uh, in a date of, uh, uh, of of arbitral proceedings in Hong Kong. I think all of those means. I mean, uh, it's the, the mainland China and Hong Kong are they're interconnected uh, more than ever before, uh, and I think uh, that will continue. Uh, I think that trend will continue. Yeah. Okay, thanks very much, Jinjing. And, and just before we hand over to Rex, just one other point I'd make that from a regulatory perspective, obviously Hong Kong has its own uh, regulatory uh, rules and, and which is sort of very well uh, established from an international perspective, but also as we've seen over the years that there's increasing regulatory cooperation between the SFC and the CSRC and, and the counterpart and there are initiatives that they're looking to doing, all of which I, I think facilitates uh, the growth of business, but also maintaining appropriate regulatory standards, which I think is, is very important. So, Rex, um, we, we nothing happens um, domestically or internationally unless the tax uh, regime is facilitative. So I'm hoping that uh, uh, over the next 10 minutes you're going to be able to convince the audience with, uh, with evidence, hard and fast evidence, that actually we, Hong Kong now... Um, you know, we're in an even better position from a, from a tax perspective, particularly so far as the uh, sort of the, the wealth management um, perspective is concerned. So can you just introduce the topic and, uh, and then sort of share with the audience some of the initiatives that, uh, that, that have happened and, and the benefit that you see that that's going to bring? Yeah, definitely. You, so I, I totally agree so with what Jeremy talked about. I think tax is one of the very important factor. Uh, to develop the uh, city as an international um, uh, investment management center and the wealth management center. Uh, as actually Joseph talked about, I think everywhere, a lot of you actually may be aware, like Hong Kong is renowned of its simple, no tax regime. Uh, Hong Kong doesn't tax capital gain, 
uh, Hong Kong doesn't tax uh, uh, offshore income, uh, dividend in general is actually not taxable in Hong Kong, and also actually more uh, relevant to the uh, wealth management, uh, private wealth management. Uh, in general, individual investment income, except for some of the uh, local property dealing profit, uh, in general, in individual investment income is not taxable in Hong Kong. Okay, so you actually buy sell securities, you actually derive again generally, individual would not be actually got taxed. So it's actually all very favorable actually tax regime uh, to develop Hong Kong as a private wealth management center. Uh, and in, in fact, the government, as actually Joseph talked about, in fact, the Hong Kong government also in the last, I would say, 18, 15 years has been actually doing a lot to refine Hong Kong tax system uh, to encourage, to, to reinforce uh, Hong Kong status as an international financial uh, investment management center. Um, we right now have the third version of the fund exemption regime. We call it unified fund exemption regime. Um, you set up an investment fund. Uh, if you actually fulfill uh, certain condition, the investment return of the uh, investment fund will not be subject to tax, uh, even though the investment fund is managed in Hong Kong. So this is very favorable. We already actually got the first version, which cover a uh, lot of the, um, uh, including marketable securities transaction and also private equity transactions. Uh, and also earlier this year, um, Hong Kong actually got a further step uh, to grant tax concession uh, for carry interest income to the fund management industry. Uh, so basically, carry interest generated from private equity transactions uh, right now Again, as long as you fulfill the condition, uh, the corporate carry, individual carry can get exemption. So this is also a very favorable step, uh, very encouraging step to establish Hong Kong uh, as a hub to, to attract private equity professional uh, to work here and manage the uh, private equity and VC fund in Hong Kong. La. And then, so far, I think we actually talk about a lot of the tax incentive, more on the investment management, the fund management industry, but how about private wealth, okay? Like I just actually mentioned about individual investment income is not taxable, in general, it's not taxable in Hong Kong. Like, but you, you probably actually understand for in the private wealth management industry, people for commercial reason, for the privacy reason, they may use some uh, family trust or the personal investment company, the PIC, uh, to invest instead of using the individual name to invest. La, using a PIC uh, to invest probably will actually make the, um, the tax analysis a little bit more complicated. Uh, because the PIC is a company, a trust is a trust, it's not individual. So they may not be able to enjoy the general individual income tax exemption. Um, and the, so far, the exemption regime that we introduce also actually may not be able to fit squarely for this actual PIC uh, and the family trust. So therefore, it's actually very encouraging. I think the government acknowledge uh, this probably we can actually do something better. We can actually continues to improve our regime. So therefore, uh, I think the financial secretary and earlier the chief executive also say that the government is uh, uh, trying hard uh, to see whether we can introduce uh, some concession for family uh, office or the family investment holding vehicle. Uh, I understand that the government is actually working hard on developing that regime. We actually still yet to see the details, but really actually looking forward uh, to that uh, new proposal to come up uh, to make good the Hong Kong entire uh, uh, private wealth management ecosystem as far as tax is concerned. Thanks for that. So that's encouraging to hear that, that from a policy intent, this, I mean, the train has left the station, and so it's just a question of uh, just when it's implemented. So I think that that's going to be very, that's, that's certainly very good news for the, the industry. Um, and Rex, we're just uh, probably gonna come back to you a little bit later, but um, I, I'd now like to sort of move on um, and really to involve uh, Chi Man and really to hear the perspective from kind of a, a Hong Kong family office, because so often you hear the experts sort of talk from an industry perspective um, from a sort of regulatory and tax, but really we really want, we know we've got the benefit now of sort of hearing from a sort of a, sort of a family office environment as to, uh, what Hong Kong actually, can, what actually Hong Kong can offer. But before uh, we ask you to sort of talk about um, the kind of family office experience that you represent, 
can you just set the scene by just giving us some statistics about um, the sort of private wealth management industry and the development of family offices in Hong Kong? So, Chi Man, what do you what do you think? Give us some facts and figures and uh, impress our audience out there. Sure, thank you, Jeremy. Uh, um, I think the, the 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 good and bad thing is, you know, most of you know I put my notes away because eighty percent of or ninety percent of the notes that I prepared, I mean, the statistics has been um, shared by Joseph, Teresa. Jing Jing. So all the statistics is gone. So my notes is gone. I'm going to be speaking on my on behalf of the data, database I have. <laughs> so I will try my best not to repeat a lot of the numbers. But I think um, on, a, on, on a bigger scale, I think uh, let me just share with you a few just very simple statistics. Um, every 10 new billionaire in the world, four come from greater China as of today. So in essence, what we are saying is every two weeks, every 72 hours, there's a new billionaire being born in greater, you know, great, greater China. And if you look at the number of, the, the, the percentage of you know, um, assets, AUM, that is being managed by family office or external or independent party, um, in Switzerland, Europe generally is about 40%. In America, it's close to 30 But in Asia, we are talking about single digit 5%. So there's a lot of room for growth, but at the same time, not just you know, standing of where we are today, but because the number of families, you know, the sheer size of the families requiring you know, the family office service is growing tremendously. So, but however, the, the, su the, the, su the demand is there, but the supply is, is not there yet. However, if you look at where we are today, in Hong Kong, um, we actually have the highest density of billionaire in the world as compared to anywhere else. I mean, if you look at Hong Kong, uh, for every um, one million population, we have about 1,364. So which means that in such a small city, we have more than 10,000 billionaires, really, really ultra-high billionaires. And, and, and what, what, what does this number as, you know, this 10,000, 10, does it, you know, is that a lot? Is it very low? So let's compare to Southeast Asia, right? which include Indonesia, which include Malaysia, you know, big country, huge populations. The whole of Southeast Asia actually has less than half of the number of billionaires Hong Kong has. So th this, is, this is really amazing that even before we grow and what we forecast that we're going to hit in five to ten years' time, we are standing at this position that is very, very clearly, you know, it, it, and, and sometimes, you know, we always tell people, you know, numbers don't lie. Num you know, smart, smart money, look, look out for the smart money, where, where the money is going. I think this is very, very clear. So I think with all these statistics, without a doubt, you know, the, the, the future of family office industry definite, de definitely is, 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 is looking great. At the same time, um, there are some, you know, very interesting uh, statistics as well that, that might be, you know, um, very pose a few, create a few challenges. For example... Um, the average age of Asian billionaires is about 10 years younger than, you know, the European billionaire, the American billionaires. And the average age of billionaire com coming out from Greater China is another 10 years average younger than the average Asian billionaires, which means that the average billionaire, age of billionaire coming out of Greater China is about 20 years younger than Europe and US. And what, what does it say? So in the next 10 years, um, some of the numbers, if you, if you look at it, is, 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 is really staggering. I mean, in the next 10 years, about 17 trillions of dollars is expected to change hand from one generation to the next generation. So then, then it's, a, it's a very different mentality in this, um, this second generation, next generation of, of, of wealth owners. When, when they take over, the, the kind of you know, expectation, the kind of risk tolerance, the kind of um, you know, values, the, the priorities are very, very different. And of course, and we, we have to talk about you know, the new billionaire which make their wealth in the, next, you know, in the past 10 years. For example, the tech companies, the biotech, all these different industry. And, and, and this new type of billionaire, they, they come from a very, very different environment as compared to first generation of, of billionaires. So I think in here, then it creates and uh, poses um, a few challenges and, and, and potentially opportunities for how we can position ourselves. And, and that is something that uh, probably what we can discuss later on is, is how Hong Kong uh, probably can reinvent ourselves, reposition ourselves, and really attract this, um, this new type of billionaires. Yeah. Well, actually, there's no time like the present. Uh, let's talk about that right now. So, 
um, it, to put you on the spot. So, so what, I mean, uh, I mean, there are a number of uh, wealth management centers within the region, but so far as Hong Kong is concerned, and obviously you're here, uh, so what do you, what sort of key benefits does, uh, I think, does, does Hong Kong offer? And, and what does Hong Kong need to be aware of in order to, re to retain that competitive edge? So, I mean, you're... I mean, in your experience, so so, what does it have to offer, and 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 to the sure. extent we need to remain competitive, what areas we would you say do you, would you say that we need just to pay particular attention to? I mean, you've heard we're, we're developing on the regulatory side, the sort of the tax side, but in in terms of just yeah. generally, what's your what's your thought on that? Sure. Um, yeah. You know, um, the the fortunate thing you know about myself is that you know I'm I'm also you know. Um, some a lot of time spending quite a lot of effort on family office association. Currently, we have uh, more than thirty members. You know, so we re represent close to fifty four, fifty three billion uh, in terms of AUM uh, among this very small uh, number of people. But I think so. One thing that you know, um, we always talk about what 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 does it take? What what what? Why do you choose Hong Kong? You know, why are we in Hong Kong? And and that that is something that you know um, that we always discuss, right? And and obviously. With all the reason that we discussed earlier, you know what Joseph mentioned, you know Theresa mentioned, Jing Jing mentioned, you know that there are many many factors for Hong Kong uh, for them to come to Hong Kong in the first place. But I think going forward, um, if you look at the future for the ne next five ten years, you know, and and with the amount of wealth that is going to be passing on to the second generation or third generation to the next generation, the seventeen trillion that we are talking about, and a new type of billionaire, I think on on one sector or industry that definitely we have to pay a lot of attention on is definitely in the private equity sector that, that we have been uh, seeing, you know. And with the support of, you know, um, the limited partnership regime uh, and, and, and the um, carry interest, um, you know, tax, um, you know, concession, I think these are definitely, uh, we are he definitely heading in the right direction. So I think private equity is something that, you know, from our observation with, uh, with the Family Office Association and our members, definitely something that we are very excited about in Hong Kong. Okay, so it's good to hear that the tax, uh, I guess the tax is developing in, in conjunction with that to facilitate that. Um, now, one often hears about um, sort of Hong Kong being the gateway to China and, um, and, you know, how long is that going to last? What role is it playing? Are there competing roles uh, sort of between sort of Hong Kong and Shanghai? Uh, or are they sort of, is there a synergy? How do you see this sort of dynamic developing from the, let's say, sort of from the sort of family office perspective, and and, and what are the and what what issues do you think about? Do you think that the, the, this next generation that you're talking about, who who has um, basically who either is receiving uh, family wealth or has been able to generate it in a short space of time, what do you think they're thinking about, and and the, the importance of Hong Kong being a gateway to to China, and also the fact that as you as you alluded to, a significant amount of the wealth actually. Has you know is is in China, and how is that being managed? Do you think? Is it me again? Um, it is. Um, your uh, just for information is my third question in a row. That's okay. This might be your last. <laughs> <laughs> if, if you're if you're good to me, otherwise I'll get one more. But yeah, okay. Um, sorry, what's the question again? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think you know um, the beauty of Hong Kong's um, or the, the you know with all the. You know, infrastructure that Hong Kong has, you know, no doubt Hong Kong is one of the best places. If not personally, I think Hong Kong is the best place in the world. But I think um, the beauty of family office is, um, you know, which we, we, we always, try, I try to, uh, always try to emphasize is that, you know, uh, family office is, you know, the core is your family office is domiciled in Hong Kong, which means the core management team, um, be it the traders, the portfolio managers, you know, the tax advisors, the you know, the philanthropy expert, you know, all these different experts are based in Hong Kong. But your asset, you know, can be anywhere in the world. You know, you can be investing in any company in the world. You know, that it's, it's just the infrastructure is so efficient. Right, so I think the key here is 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 really about the infrastructures and 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 all this macro um, environment that we have. But but with, with one thing that I think uh, is the most important about Hong Kong is the talent that we have in Hong Kong. Um, of course, you know, uh, family office is a new industry. Uh, definitely, we have we need to push on with the you know government's initiative since 2016 about the asset management, um, um, you know, developing the talent for asset management sector and the wealth management sector uh, since 2016. But most importantly, we have, to, we have to understand that, you know, there are already the highest, a big number of people, um, financial experts in Hong Kong already, which means that for families that are looking to set up their headquarters in Hong Kong, you know, a lot of these 
um, the compo key component of of a, of, a, of a successful family office is really in place. You know, it's really here. So I think in here uh, we we really have to um, really play our role in in in, in uh, putting things together. I think putting different parts together and, and really you know uh, promoting ourselves. And that is also one of the mandate uh, of Family Office Association because one of the thing is you know we want to promote Hong Kong as a family office hub in Asia, maybe even the world. And one of the thing that you know uh, we plan to to achieve that is definitely to promote Hong Kong as a family office hub out of Hong Kong. You know, with COVID. You know, obviously, we, we are talking to a lot of different associations in Europe, in US, you know, having joint events. It, it, what we are really trying to do is expose Hong Kong's name in the family office hub to other parts of the world. I think that is very, very, very important. You know, so that is something that, uh, on behalf of Family Office Association, that is something that we will achieve to, to, to hit. And with COVID, actually, it has made our life a lot easier because, you know, we are ba basically forced to do webinar and Zoom. And, and with Zoom and with technology, it's a challenge, but it also brings opportunity. We become extremely efficient. We become, you know, the other last, last week we have typhoon number eight, but, you know, I did two webinars. And no typhoon number eight is going to stop me because, I'm sorry, typhoon number eight is in Hong Kong, but not anywhere else in the world. So I think that's the beauty of some time of technology. We become extremely efficient. And that is something that we're going to leverage on this you know, technology and, and really you know, get our name out there. I mean, not in Hong Kong, but out of greater China, in Europe, in US, in other parts of Southeast Asia as well. Now, Chi Man, you'll be pleased to know that no further questions for now, but I may, come back, I may come back to you, <laughs> so don't relax. Uh, so, uh, Ricky, I want to now sort of move on and from, a, I guess, sort of a private banking perspective and sort of Credit Suisse. So, can you explain to the audience, uh, or just give us an overview of Hong Kong's current uh, private banking landscape, just to start off, and then I'll ask you to expand on some issues, depending on what you say. Yeah. Um, I, I started this uh, career, I think, way back in uh, 1996, so 25 years ago. I think at that point, I don't think we had a sort of a private banking or PWM industry per se. Right, the bank that I, I joined is not Credit Suisse, by the way. Right, it was a U.S. bank, so it, it did not have a PWM or PB business. I joined the equity division, which happens to have a desk which cover the high net worth individuals and families, and it's part of equities because the the product that we we we, we dealt with on an everyday basis was a pretty much cash equities. So that sort of consists of 90% uh, of our business at that point, right? So uh, let's move forward 20 years later. I think cash equity today account for, let's say, single digit percentage of our PB business. So just from the product perspective, right? Um, I think it has changed a lot. Today's we, uh, private uh, cash equities, strict bonds, cash bonds, I think these are all what we call the flow products. But I think uh, our investors, our clients, they demand a lot more from the public bank, per se, right? So they need, uh, for example, they set up the family office, and we will support that. They have their philanthropy at force, and we have to support that. They have to, to plan about their succession planning, and we are part of that program as well. So today, I, I think the, the, in terms of the service and products today, I think as a private bank, we need to provide a lot more. So uh, for a large banks like Credit Suisse, uh, we have to invest heavily in terms of the platform, the service, and the products. And that's one part of the story. Another part is, uh, of course, the technology. In the past, I mean, it's all done by menu. We input the order, we place an order. Today, just to give you a sense of how technology plays in our industry, um, at today, I think 70% of our cash equity trades are done on what we call a DPP, digital public banking, right? I think 10 years ago, it was 0%, right? So the demand for technology is, uh, is getting higher and higher. And then another point is uh, I think clients are becoming more sophisticated, right? So they demand not only uh, service from investment, they need us to be part of their sort of a expansion plan for their companies, be, be it private or public. So we work closely with our sort of other departments of the firm, you know, investment banking, uh, trading desk, to provide different type of service to the clients. So I think the industry today has changed a lot. And another point, last point, is on the 
regulatory point of view, right? In the past, I think 25 years ago, our department, we, can, we could only afford one compliance officer. And today, this one person job consists of, I think, a few departments, from uh, FLDS, which we call First Line of Defense, to a, uh, AML, you know, anti-money laundering, to FCC, financial crime, right? So just from the regulatory point of view, I think it demands a lot more investment from all the banks to support this part of business. And so on the back of that then, so what are the key, some of the key trends you're seeing from an investor's perspective? Can you share your views? What are, what are, what are investors, what are they thinking about? What are they doing? What, what are they telling you and asking you? Yeah, I think we, we, we briefly talked about this in, in your previous question, right? I think today uh, our investors, our clients have become a lot more sophisticated, right? And uh, just not too long ago, I think a simple strategy, for example, uh, buying a portfolio of high yield bonds with a bit of leverage could provide very respectable returns for many years, right? And today we know what happened to that single strategy, right? So I think it's a, it's, I think it is a good development uh, in my view because clients today, they are more open-minded about different investment ideas, different investment strategies, different asset classes, which they would have rejected a few years ago, right? So they look at uh, products from uh, private equity to hedge funds, from real estate to private credit, right? So just from the products and, and service point of view, um, they demand a lot more from the private banks today, right? And we also talk about, uh, um, they also demand our sort of advice on the family office, setting up a family office, uh, succession planning, you know, uh, family trust. Uh, so they, they are becoming more sort of uh, institutional uh, clients. So the, the old days of uh, giving them an idea, buying Apple or selling Microsoft is long gone. Those are commoditized surface of a sort of a business, right? So I I, th I think that's the, the 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 trend that I'm seeing. Another trend that I'm I'm, I'm seeing is uh, more and more clients they embrace the ESG concept, right? Not too long ago, five years ago, nobody talked about ESG, right? Today, um, just to give you a flavor, right? Just on our product shelf, we have twenty sort of uh, products. They are ESG compliance, right? And every single idea that we produce on a daily basis, we assign a ESG rating from one to five. Five being the most compliance, one being the least. So we, we have a, a, a quite a lot of clients, they look at these products and, and they say, you know, I have to invest in a, a ESG product because of the, the family governance or, or the, the, the sort of the, the mandate requirement of their family office, right? So uh, that tells you, uh, I think the, the platform today, the service required today is very different, not just 25 years ago, five years ago, it's completely changed. Yeah. Actually, that's, can I just, uh, just uh, go back to the sort of the ESG again, because I think it's, it doesn't matter what jurisdiction you're, you're sitting in, basically uh, everyone is talking about ESG, yeah. it's a political issue, it's a regulatory issue, it's here to stay um, for the foreseeable future for obvious reasons, but, um, are you seeing, obviously you're seeing that uh, families require uh, that ESG be taken into account and saying actually it, it's a key element of our focus. Are you, yet, are you starting yet to have the discussion around performance and so actually uh, that there's a, you know, you want to, uh, families want to do the right thing, you want to basically be investing in, uh, in green, uh, in, a, in a sort of a green way which has, you know, philanthropic uh, benefits as well, but to the extent that that may be subject to overall performance, what's the discussion you're you're having, and and what do you say? Yeah, uh, I think that's a very good uh, very good question. I think there are a lot of research that have been done on this topic. Uh, when you try to do good for the society, for the world, do you have to give up on investment returns? I think many 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 research have shown that actually they can go hand in hand, right? I think we uh, increasingly, I think the whole world from the investment world, mostly I think it, it started from the West and now it's gradually uh, become part of the, our life in, in the East as well, right? So uh, there are lots of uh, research who shows that actually being ESG, you achieve 
better returns. I mean, I, I want to give you one example. Is uh, we have this uh, sort of a unique products at our firm, which I'm not trying to advertise. Right? We have a sort of a spark tracker. We track the, the a portfolio of stocks which uh, 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 ESG compliance in China, which we call sustainable China. Year to date, the performance of that spark tracker is 50%. And we know all. We know what happened to the China broader market, which is down, you know, eight to ten percent year to date, right? So uh, I, I don't think people are in this space just for the sake of doing good. They realize that uh, actually they can make very respectful returns by doing good to the society. I think more and more people realize it. And also, and you, and I, I think another comment to make is that, again, that dovetails quite well into some of the initiatives that we're seeing that the government has already been uh, rolling out across the um, sort of the green finance sector as well, which, which I think, you know, from my, um, uh, you know, from my perspective, I, I think that that's increasing investment into that area as well. So, Ricky, before I sort of open it up to, for a bit, a bit more of a general discussion amongst the panel, I just want to ask you, and maybe you've answered this already, but I mean, the... What do, you, what do you see as the kind of the main challenges being faced by private banking? I mean, you said, you know, regulatory compliance, but I think no matter what industry you're operating in, whether it's the financial services sector, I think probably you'd hear the same response from a regulatory perspective. But, but um, obviously, in your, you know, you, you've come a long way in your years of experience. What, what else do you, are you seeing as the kind of the main challenges? And, 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 and how do you think, obviously, that's from an institutional or banking sector perspective, but also how do you think from a... Hong Kong's perspective, we're, we're, you're seeing that Hong Kong's position to, to deal with that from a, from a jurisdictional perspective. Yeah, I think I can see from, from the sort of a front office perspective, from the practitioner point of view, I think there are I think two or three major challenges that I see, right? I think number one, I think we talk about the talent pool in Hong Kong, I think which is already very good by, by, by any standards. But I think uh, a lot of banks uh, China banks, European banks, U.S. banks, local banks, they all try to expand this private banking industry in Hong Kong because this business, I think, to many people is predictable, is recurring, uh, it is pretty stable, right? So I, I think we, I, I wouldn't say we have a shortage of talent, but uh, increasingly we find it a bit more difficult to recruit, right? I think year to date for our firm alone, we hire 100 relationship managers, right? So to, 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 to keep the pace of uh, expansion or development of the industry, I think the talent pool uh, is becoming an issue, right? I, 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 I'm glad to hear that. I think we have, uh, the government is putting a lot of initiatives in terms of growing the talent. But uh, at this point, I, I see that we have to take a bit of risk to hire sort of a non-traditional PB background to be the RM, right? I think which is good and bad, right? Because we can expand the business from different sort of a, a, a background, right? Uh, so that's number one. And number two, increasingly, we feel like uh, there are also potentially risk associated with the geopolitical conflict that we are seeing, right? I mean, in a very hypothetical situation, which we actually talk about with some of my colleagues, right? For example, if we have a client who is being sanctioned by the US government. And in Hong Kong, if, I mean, it's a hypothetical, right? If the Chinese government or Hong Kong government try to install this uh, sort of anti sanction rule, what do we do? Do we offboard this crime? Or do we keep the crime, right? I mean, these are all hypothetical, by the way. <coughs> but uh, increasingly, I think this is something that we should have uh, sort of keep in mind, right? Yeah, okay. Well, thanks very much for that, uh, Ricky. Rex, you're looking quite relaxed, so I think I'm going to ask you uh, <laughs> sort of a, a, a question. I'm done. <laughs> uh, no, I'm going to come back to you. I just, um, but just on sort of talent, because obviously um, from an accounting perspective, I mean, all the accountants, I mean, uh, the the numbers uh, that you hear that are employed, sort of, uh, sort of Hong Kong and sort of across the border, are you know they run in they're, they're huge numbers, but but one just assumes that from a, a talent perspective, you've got an endless stream of, uh, of sort of talent. But is that, I mean, what, what, what are the issues that uh, are you, do you think for, are you facing from a sort of generally servicing perspective? Because obviously the industry needs ongoing talent and the grooming of it. So can you just share your sort of thoughts? And, and are we now able to sort of, uh, does, it, does it matter where the talent is sitting? So actually, um, you know, that actually if you, can you be, are you lever can you just use talent uh, sitting sort of regionally or, or in, in the PRC to service 
things that are operating here. I'd just like your views on that. Yeah. Okay. In terms of talent in our, in our profession, I think this always the probably actually the number one challenges that our industry is facing. Probably I believe the other professional services are also actually facing the same issue. Uh, opportunities, a lot out there, but it's a matter of whether we have sufficient people to service or to grab this opportunity. Uh, like in terms of the talent, yes, I think the local resources, we, we, we have actually seen, I think right now it's actually getting better in recent years. Uh, we have actually seen quite a lot of the talent coming from the mainland. Also, a lot of the our our uh, uh, the, the the young generation, uh, basically, they actually study abroad. Then they actually try to actually come back uh, to Asia uh, to get exposure. They may not immediately actually go back to China, but they actually see Hong Kong as an opportunity to offer them that international exposure. So we also actually see quite a lot of the talent basically actually coming. Basically, they are Chinese speaking talent. Uh, they study abroad, come back to Hong Kong. Uh, and then get the international exposure. We see that that stream of the uh, resources pool. Uh, but I think Jeremy, actually, you you mentioned very well is about um, whether we we can only rely on the talent on the ground. Whether we can actually leverage on the talent sitting elsewhere. Okay, putting aside the tax issue, we we have we will actually get into complicated or permanent establishment issue. Putting aside the tax issue, uh, but yes, I would I would agree. GBA offers a good opportunity, right? So when Hong Kong actually look at GBA, we actually think about China, GBA offers us a big market, right? But probably it's all at the same time, it offers a good talent pool. Okay, how they, this talent pool can actually help us to support the growth of Hong Kong, right? So I think that's something that we probably can actually look further into. Yeah, I think that, that's, thanks, thanks for that. Um, now, from a, a legal perspective, uh, Junjing, any any comments on that? I mean, um, in terms of you know, you've got you've got staff all sitting all over the uh, the sort of region. But how are you, how are you sort of pull? Do you think it matters where people are uh, are being based in terms of pr providing of the service? Obviously, subject to compliance with uh, <laughs> the relevant uh, regulations around that. But are you pooling? You, do you see in terms of what Hong Kong can offer? Do you see the ability to bring in talent um, in you know from other jurisdictions facilitates that? Yes, I think um, in legal industry, we face the same issue as well, as Rex just said. I think actually in our uh, team, I mean, for, for this lunch, I think our team leaders in our firm, KBLM, has a meeting. And I think the topic, we, one of the topics we talk about is talent, that I said, we don't need to worry about the business, we just worry about the people. So if we have the right people, just hire, that's it. So now I think um, the GBA areas, of course, um, uh, I mean, for legal industry, it's, it's a bit special because if you need to advise on Hong Kong law, you need to be Hong Kong advice. You need to be sitting in Hong Kong. So that's why I think it's it's more complicated than the other industry. So I think even though we have more than more than ten thousand um, uh, lawyers in Hong Kong, but I think <coughs> with the growing opportunities in Hong Kong, I think we need more legal talent. I think the secretary, f um, the, the 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 ministry, uh, the, the the secretary for justice also mentioned that. Um, they are uh, taking initiative to develop and train more legal talent, attract more legal talent to Hong Kong. And one of them is like, uh, uh, I think they organized those GPA legal professional examination, which have completed, I think, in July this year. I think uh, that kind of program will train more people that can work for both Hong Kong legal market and the, the, the mainland China. Legal market. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, I think uh, we just want to make sure we need leave enough time for uh, for Q and A. So I just uh, I understand there's a iPad which is going to be passed to me, which I hope I can work. And let's see, are there any questions on there at the moment? Okay, I just uh, sort of a general question about uh, we're looking at sort of Hong Kong um, as a cost center. Um, actually, we we didn't really sort of test. We sort of touch on it. I mean, in terms of. Um, is uh, from a cost perspective, you're sort of, you know, you have operations here. How does that, um, you know, how does that equate to other jur jurisdictions? So, I'm afraid I've got to uh, come back and ask you another question because uh, from your from your experience and obviously from a sort of a, a, a operating in Hong Kong, um, you know, what's the uh, from a cost perspective? How do you? Um, what are your thoughts on that? Sure. Um Thank you. Uh, so yeah, so all, all, speaking on behalf of family offices, there has got, you know, uh, offices across, you know, 
you know, in Europe, in, in other, other part of Asia, in US. You know, uh, I think Hong Kong, in terms of cost, I would say definitely is in line with, you know, a lot of these major city, major financial hub. But I think, um, to me personally, I would say that, you know, uh, Hong Kong <coughs> is not, is, I wouldn't call it a cheap place, right? Because we are not. But, but however, I think uh, Hong Kong offers a lot of values, which means that, you know, you might have the co same um, cost for the operation team, for the trading team, for the, for the professional team that's running a family office. But, you know, the, the efficiency of the financial market and the efficiency of, you know, the talent in Hong Kong is actually extremely, extremely high. And uh, we, we are also one of the most hardworking, um, you know, cities in the world. So I think in terms of this, you know, um, area, I think Hong Kong definitely uh, create a lot of values in terms of, you know, our, the talent pool that we create. But, you know, th to add on a little bit, you know, about what, you know, Jing Jing and, and, and Rex, you know, and, and Ricky mentioned earlier about talent. I think on one part is, you know, really about the quantity of talent because simply put, you know, the AUM of, you know, uh, Hong Kong wealth management industry is growing, right? So at, you know, end of last year, we have 3.3 billion, a trillion. And, and as of right now, you know, I think we have just exceeded, you know, 4, four trillion, right? So, the, the, so the, 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 the industry itself is, is going bigger. But at the same time, I think there's also, um, a need for change of mindset, you know, to, to, to switch between, you know, uh, from a service provider to acting on behalf of the family. I think that is important. And, and that is something that uh, we keep on emphasize that, you know, um, um, that is something that, you know, we, we have to understand when, when you're acting on a, for a bank and when, when you're acting for on, on behalf of a family, it's actually two very different um, uh, priorities. So I think that is something that, you know, sometimes it's just need a bit of, you know, um, um, really about your education, about the industry. I think that, and, 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 you know, just about last year, you know, um, of the wealth management industry transaction, which is about 1.1 um, trillion, you know, about 18% actually came from family offices. But, you know, <coughs> of, the m of the workforce in the wealth management industry, um, what is the percentage, you know, that are family office ready? I, have n I don't have the number, but I can tell you definitely is much lower than 18%. So th this is something that, you know, just in terms of, you know, uh, sometimes, you know, we say, you know, convert or, or reinvent ourselves, I think that is important in Hong Kong as well. As much as we need to have more talent, but I think, you know, at the same time, you know, converting some of the talent we already have. Sure, and I think what you touched upon education. I think one point to note, actually, is, is Hong, from an educational perspective, um, Hong Kong's making a lot of investment uh, in training up um, the sort of, you know, the, the young talent, you know, whether it be through university courses or other degrees around wealth management, so that's also good to know. So in fairness to the room, we, we, we have, this is an online event and also an in-person event, so I've had one from online. So are there, are, is there, are there anyone in the audience who would uh, like to uh, ask a question? So could we get, there's a hand at the back, could we just get a microphone delivered to the, to the back of the room so we can hear? There's a quick hand. Yep. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, a really insightful panel. Um, I had um, two questions, and they one of them might be a little bit more controversial than the other, but I'm going to throw that one first at you. Um, there was a lot of talk about like setting up infrastructure, setting up um, you know the the right regulatory policies and the tax policies, and that's all fantastic. Uh, but there's a new uh, you know emerging asset class. And it's probably been making a lot of the headlines. So I was curious if any of you or all of you had thoughts on the crypto market and what that will entail for Hong Kong, the private wealth industry, and overall kind of that whole direction. And then the second question, uh, which is probably a little less controversial, uh, and, but nevertheless quite in-depth, is my thoughts or your thoughts on how, you know, uh, a few years ago, you know, the Belt and Road was a very hot initiative. How is that still playing into, um, you know, Hong Kong's kind of wealth management industry and whether Hong Kong is like looking into a lot of those countries along uh, the belt to attract those family offices, high net individuals to come here uh, and set up. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Well, in fairness to the panel, um, I now realize I should not have requested co questions from the floor. So they were quite tricky. So, but I, so I will answer, try and answer the first one uh, in terms of uh, from a regulatory perspective and the sort of the asset class in terms of cryptocurrency and where Hong Kong is positioned. Um, I think it's fair to say that uh, that it, it is cryptocurrency, and I wouldn't. I don't think Hong Kong is just for Hong Kong, but it, it, from a re regulatory perspective, it continues to be challenging. And I think there are you have two choices as a from a regulatory perspective. You can either just uh, just let it develop 
um, and then regulate it, or you can try and regulate it either before it develops or as it's developing. And I think the, the, the Hong Kong, the SFC's position is they very much want to regulate it right at the start, um, I, I guess from an investor protection perspective. So I think that, that there, there has been some uh, sort of tension within the industry uh, on the basis that actually is Hong, is Hong Kong doing enough for, to facilitate that as an asset class? Um, but all I would say is that it, in my uh, dealings with the, uh, the, 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 you know, the SFC, their key focus is, is really is around investor protection at the moment. And, and so I think we are seeing, you, you know, as an asset class right now, it's, gonna, it's sort of more restricted to professional investors than retail. Um, and so I, I, I think we will get there in Hong Kong, but I think we're not going to get there at the expense of uh, investor protection. And it may mean that you know, some other jurisdictions move, you know, basically are more favorable at the moment because of it, but I think in time, uh, I think sort of Hong Kong's general position has been, actually, they just want to be able to regulate it appropriately as it develops, rather than to let it develop too fast, uh, for there to be some uh, investor losses, and then to sort of deal with uh, to deal with that. But we've got a, in terms of a, an asset class, um, just from the from the banking side, what, are, you, are you seeing sort of clients? I mean, uh, request that or looking at that more as an asset class? Yeah, I think a lot of clients ask about our views on Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, right? I think at this point, I think you said it really well, right? I, I think we have to look at, uh, from the investor point of view, whether it's a safe asset for our clients to invest in, right? At this point, I think uh, we, we are taking a more like wait and see attitude. I think it's an asset class that is still pretty new and uh, there, there has been a lot of controversy, I mean, among different investors, different regulators and point of view. And at this point, I think we are just taking a wait and see attitude. Uh, we, 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 we have different seminars and different teaching on what cryptocurrency is, what blockchain is, but it's more for the education purpose. But uh, as an asset class at this point, we do not offer it at our bank. Okay. Um, any comments from a sort of what, what, what are families, uh, what are the families thinking? Um, sure. I think, I think, you know, on behalf of, you know, let's say on um, Raffles Family Office, as you can see, recently we appointed an uh, independent board advisor, uh, Zen Kwan, uh, who is uh, very experienced and very knowledgeable in the, in the digital currency, in the cryptocurrency world. I mean, one of the things that we, you know, um, that we encounter is definitely a lot, a lot of reverse inquiry from families, you know, uh, on our views about, you know, this, this new type of asset class. And, and, and to a lot of us, you know, it's, it's really new because exactly five years ago, nobody even know what it is. Right, so so I think e e even right now, um, it is 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 never it's never easy. But uh, again, you know, one of the part of the job about family office that we are so different from you know other you know f from other um, financial intermediary is that family office tend to plan really really long term, and 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 within this uh, family constitution and different um, risk governance, uh, one of the thing that we always uh, prepare for is the unknown future. And and that is that is why uh, we, you know we always say you know in within the the family um, office or within the family office investment committee you definitely need to have an option to an uh, open option to to attract or to appoint or to invite you know different asset class experts because in this case it's very clear you know uh, today it might be you know a, a digital asset cryptocurrency in five years time it might be a whole different thing so I think uh, in future we we have to stay nimble and we have to really act on best behalf or best interest of the family I think that's the most important. Thanks very much. And just in terms of, uh, just trying to follow up on the second question, Belt and Road, Ricky, in terms of, uh, I guess, sort of investment into uh, sort of Belt and Road uh, kind of being ongoing, evolving, what are you, any sort of comments in terms of what, yours, what you've seen? No, I think we, we, look, we, we look at it as more like from the investment point of view, right? So we have, diff we, we created different vehicles and products to capitalize on the One Belt and Road initiative, right? So, yeah, so, so that's pretty much it. All right, well, ladies and gentlemen, I think that brings us to the end of uh, this uh, first panel. And uh, please join me in thanking the panelists for a very engaging discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, for the insightful sharing. Please take your seats off stage. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I hope you all enjoyed such meaningful discussions on the latest policy initiatives relating to private wealth management in Hong Kong. Now it is time for us to begin our second panel discussion. The discussion topic is comprehensive legal support for private wealth management in Hong Kong. 
So panel two will showcase the full spectrum of legal services relating to private wealth management Hong Kong has to offer. We are honored to have invited the following distinguished guests as panelists as they will tell us why Hong Kong is the best option in managing private wealth because of the comprehensive legal support. Now let me introduce for you our moderator of panel two. He is Dr. Thomas So. Let us welcome Dr. Thomas So, please. Let's give a big hand to welcome Thomas. Thomas is the chairman of Ibram and advisory board member of Asian Academy of International Law. Dr. So is a partner of Mayor Brown with experience in advising on shareholders and equity-related disputes, property-related, libel and media-related litigation work, as well as litigation and arbitration in the PRC. And let us welcome Ms. Joelle Lau. Ms. Lau, please. Ms. Lau is the partner in charge of the Hong Kong office of Jones Day. She is qualified to practice law in Hong Kong, New York, England and Wales and Singapore and has over 20 years of multi-jurisdictional experience in corporate finance, fund formation, private equity and mergers and acquisitions transactions. Then we have Ms. Shaolin Chen. Ms. Chen, please. Ms. Chen is a partner at Deakins with over two decades of experience in family, mental capacity and private wealth work. She has been appointed by the High Court as committee to manage the financial affairs of persons without mental capacity. Last but not least, let me introduce Mr. Dita Ye. Dita, please. The chairman of the Financial Dispute Resolution Center. He is a practicing solicitor in Hong Kong for 33 years, and he is a past president of the Law Society of Hong Kong. His primary practice areas are in capital markets, securities, and mergers and acquisitions. Now I'll hand over to Dr. So, please. Thank you. Thank you, MC. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, those who are here and those who are online. Uh, you have heard a very interesting uh, uh, panel just now talking about policy initiative uh, relating to the wealth management uh, sector in Hong Kong. Now, wealth management involves property rights, you know, money, assets belonging to people. What is more important than the legal protection of those wealth if they are going to be managed in Hong Kong? So this panel, we're going to have distinguished speakers from different uh, legal practices who are going to share with us their views on what sort of legal support that Hong Kong can offer as a whole in kind of one-stop shop. The moment when your money arrives, you're thinking of how to have your money accumulated or generated in Hong Kong to be managed, to be protected, and what if there is dispute? What kind of mechanism, what kind of legal support and services that you can get from Hong Kong? So without further ado, the uh, the MC has done a very good introduction of the speakers. Uh, I need no further detail of introduction, but what we're going to do is, uh, uh, I have seen uh, the uh, PowerPoints that they have prepared. Uh, they are very, very interesting. I'm sure that you will all enjoy it. Uh, lawyers talk normally are boring, but this time round, I can guarantee you, this is a very interesting panel. So the first speaker uh, is uh, Ms. Joelle Lau. Uh, Joelle is, uh, is a partner in charge of Jones Day. Uh, as she will talk about from uh, the perspective of when the money comes, right? how can you uh, uh, legally, what, what kind of legal system, legal support that we have, and why is Hong Kong the best place, in our view, for your money to come here and to be managed? Joelle, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you. Um, Right, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for your time today. I am Joelle. Um, I'm the partner in charge of the Hong Kong office of Jones Day. Um, we're an international law firm with 42 offices worldwide. I'm very happy to be here today to be telling you about the overview of the legal support services for private wealth management in Hong Kong and why Hong Kong should be the preferred hub for private wealth management. Let me just... Um, Thomas did promise that it would be interesting, but he didn't promise that we are technically um, <laughs> competent to <laughs> adjust the slides. So, 
Can I? Okay, great. Um, so we've heard a very informative um, discussion of the previous panel on the latest policy updates um, relating to private wealth management in Hong Kong. So in relation to the comprehensive financial and legal infrastructure in Hong Kong, supporting private wealth management, the track record, the talent pool, which underlies Hong Kong's established position as an international legal hub, also makes Hong Kong an ideal base for family offices. With the support of a bus stable business environment, the free flow of capital, a simple and competitive tr tax structure, backed by the strategic location and high level of international connectivity, Hong Kong remains and is the best option for private wealth management. Professional legal services comprise an integral part of the infrastructure supporting private wealth management in Hong Kong. Hong Kong's economic freedom and competitiveness is well recognized internationally. The clear institutional strengths of doing business in, Sing in Hong Kong includes the rule of law and the judicial independence which form the core values of Hong Kong. Hong Kong's reliable legal system and extensive pool of legal talent is the cornerstone of Hong Kong's success as an international legal center. Hong Kong has a well-tested common law system, a judiciary which is transparent and which has a long history in dealing with commercial disputes. It is also the only global financial hub where the legal infrastructure is able to run in a bilingual manner in both English and Chinese. As a special administrative region of China, with the benefit of one country, two system, Hong Kong is the only city in China which adopts the common law system, enabling it to serve as the preferred platform for sourcing international legal and arbitration services for family offices with a global perspective. So as a professional working in Hong Kong for the past two decades, I'm very proud to share this slide with everyone. The slide shows the recent rankings made by the World Economic Forum, the International Institute for Management, and the World Justice Re Projects in relation to global competitiveness and the rule of law index. So in terms of overall competitiveness, Hong Kong has been ranked first and second in Asia. And in terms of overall ranking, in terms of the rule of law, Hong Kong ranks third in Asia. The national legal systems adopted globally are generally based on one of the four basic legal systems, civil law, common law, statutory law, and religious law. Both the civil and common law systems can be considered the most widespread in the world. However, Common law is utilized by the greatest number of people compared to any single civil law system. Hong Kong has a unique advantage of being the only common law jurisdiction within China. Article 8 of the Basic Law allows for the continuation of the common law system, which has been practiced in Hong Kong for more than 170 years. The legacy of the common law in Hong Kong has en enabled Hong Kong to build a well-established commercial case law which is highly recognized by the international business community. Hong Kong's common law provides a clear, transparent, familiar, and accessible legal framework to support and facilitate commercial dealings in private wealth management. Hong Kong's common law is also similar to the laws of other major economies, such as the UK, the US, and Australia, and complements the market norms of international business transactions. This ensures that family offices and private wealth investors will have solid legal protection, whether they're investing in Hong Kong or channeling investments into China through Hong Kong or to other economies. It is clear that Hong Kong has a requisite track record and the setup to enable it to be a global hub for private wealth management. Family offices based in Hong Kong will greatly benefit from Hong Kong's reliable and commercially minded regulatory and legal framework, a favorable tax regime, a globally linked banking system, an abundant supply of talent pool, including lawyers, and accessibility to a range of investment opportunities in mainland China and beyond. Hong Kong's robust legal services sector includes more than 9,800 practicing solicitors, including registered foreign lawyers from 33 different jurisdictions, and about 1,500 practicing barristers, of which there are 105 senior counsels. There is also a large number of international law firms with offices in Hong Kong. As a global trade finance and business hub, Hong Kong has a wealth of legal expertise in areas such as private equity, 
mergers and acquisition, capital markets, banking and finance, tax, intellectual property, and information technology. The legal professionals in Hong Kong are also equipped with an international perspective and experience in handling international transactions, given Hong Kong's track record as an international financial hub. The legal expertise offered by practitioners in Hong Kong covers the spectrum of focus necessary for private wealth management. Beyond the traditional legal expertise needed for deal making, Hong Kong is also able to provide legal expertise needed for emerging areas of focus, as mentioned in the previous panel, for, sub, uh, for topics like ESG, digital technology, life sciences, and fintech. The infrastructure underpinning the provision of legal services is also a critical consideration in private wealth management, especially in the light of the pandemic, which has expedited the need for technology to be utilized in all aspects of deal making. With the strong support of the Department of Justice, Hong Kong has also harnessed law tech to ensure the efi efficient provision of legal services in the post-COVID business mode. I would like to take a couple of minutes to just talk about um, three topics um, related to the in legal infrastructure in Hong Kong, which is relevant to private wealth management and family offices, namely the trust industry in Hong Kong, dispute resolution services, and Hong Kong as a preferred venue for fundraising. Where trust structure is of interest, Family offices and high net worth individuals based in Hong Kong can elect to either form a trust under the Hong Kong trust regime or set up offshore trusts in the Cayman or BVI or other jurisdictions through legal and professional service providers based in Hong Kong. The practitioners here are well placed to advise family offices with the appropriate tax structure taking into account accounting, legal, tax, commercial, and other relevant considerations. In terms of dispute resolution, Hong Kong's well-established legal system, together with its comprehensive dispute resolution options and judicial independence, have provided a solid foundation for establishing Hong Kong as a major international legal and dispute resolution center in the Asia-Pacific region. Hong Kong law as a choice of law offers global investors the level of protection in line with the world's other major legal systems. Hong Kong offers various types of dispute resolution, including litigation, arbitration, and mediation. In addition to the well-respected court system in Hong Kong, reputable dispute resolution bodies, including the Hong Kong International Arbitration Center, the International Chamber of Commerce International Court of Arbitration, the China International Economic Trade and Arbitration Commission and IBRAM operate in Hong Kong. My fellow panelist, Dita Yi, will tell us a bit more about the Financial Dispute Resolution Center in Hong Kong shortly. So since 2015, Hong Kong has been amongst the top five preferred seats for arbitration globally. As the PRC is the signatory to the New York Convention, Awards made in Hong Kong can be enforced in more than 150 countries and places under it. In addition, the Hong Kong Department of Justice and the Supreme Court, People's Court of Mainland have signed a number of mutual legal assistance arrangements on reciprocal recognition and enforcement of judgment, interim measures in arbitral proceedings, and other arrangements. These arrangements have made Hong Kong the only jurisdiction outside of the mainland where mutual recognition of and assistance in insolvency proceedings are allowed, and the only seat of arbitration outside the mainland where parties are able to apply to mainland courts for interim measures. All of these enhances Hong Kong as a gateway to doing business in China. With a sound financial services regulatory system, supervising over 200 authorized institutions, it is no surprise that Hong Kong has positioned itself as a leading fundraising hub in the region. The legal services and financial services infrastructure has helped Hong Kong become Asia's number one fund management hub for both Chinese and non-Chinese investors. Whether a family office or high net worth individual is looking to make an investment through private equity, debt, listed securities, derivatives, or other, or other financial products. Whether such investments are meant to be short-term, medium-term, or long-term, Hong Kong is a venue where options and professional services and great lawyers are in abundance. 
the Hong Kong Stock Exchange has established itself as a leading listing venue globally. The Hong Kong IPO market has been ranked first in seven of the tw past 12 years. In 2020 alone, Hong Kong 398 billion was raised in the Hong Kong markets. The Hong Kong Stock Exchange is the ideal platform for private wealth investors looking to exit their private equity investments through an initial public offering. The same reasons why Hong Kong is a successful international financial hub also makes Hong Kong a choice listing jurisdiction for many companies looking to IPO. The well-established legal system and the well-established regulatory review process provides a strong and attractive foundation for companies to raise funds. It gives international investors confidence that they need to invest in these companies. Through Stock Connect, companies listed on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange will also have access to investors located in the mainland. I would like to round out my discussion with a quick run through of recent developments in Hong Kong relevant to private wealth management. As mentioned earlier, the cross boundary wealth management connect system um, across the Guangdong, Hong Kong, and Macau Greater Bay Area, launched in September 2021, will allow eligible mainland Hong Kong and Macau residents in the Greater Bay Area to invest in wealth management products distributed by banks across each market. The legal practitioners here and the legal services here are ready and well positioned to help private wealth investors and uh, private wealth investors um, benefit from this Connect scheme. The new limited fund partnership regime in Hong Kong, implemented in August last year, allows the establishment of funds onshore in Hong Kong with certain tax benefits, including concessions under the Inland Revenue Concessions for Carried Interest Ordinance. So to conclude with the commercial, financial and legal infrastructure that Hong Kong has, Hong Kong is an ideal gateway and a super connector for investments from China to other markets and for investments into China, for, into, chi in, into China from other parts of the world. Um, so I would like to end my presentation today um, with a photo of the beautiful Tingma Bridge, um, which sort of, I think, um, sums up the, the super connected role of, of Hong Kong. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for sharing with us as to what you think, why Hong Kong uh, is the ideal place for family office and wealth management. That include you have briefly taken us through the legal infrastructure in Hong Kong, various types of specialized legal uh, practices offered by various practitioners, including the, uh, the ability to raise, fund, uh, to raise funds, to form funds, uh, dispute resolution services uh, 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 arising out of that. Um, I, I do have uh, a couple of questions for you, but uh, I think that uh, we have some time after all the uh, presentations. So maybe uh, I would reserve that question to later. And for those who have questions and uh, I believe would pose that online and the iPad will be given to me later on, uh, do save your questions and put that on. Uh, we will have... 10, 10 minutes or, yeah, roughly 10 minutes Q&A uh, later on. So uh, we save our questions for you later. Uh, second uh, speaker, uh, we have the pleasure of having uh, Ms. Sharon Chan, a partner from Deacons, uh, to uh, share with us her views. Uh, this is quite interesting about uh, uh, the challenges that we might face in uh, managing private wealth. Uh, particularly, uh, she will share with us uh, some statistics, some data about the aging population and how that bring about uh, rooms for growth in the wealth management sector in Hong Kong. That would be an interesting uh, uh, part. Um, uh, the floor is yours, okay. uh, Sherlyn. Thank you, Thomas, for the kind introduction. And um, thank you very much to the Secretary of Justice, FSTB, and Invest Hong Kong for inviting me to join this webinar, focusing on the legal support for private wealth management in Hong Kong. We've heard from Joelle on how the common law legal system has been in practice for over 170 years, providing such a stable environment for private wealth and family businesses to grow. I would like to share with you how family and private wealth lawyers can support the needs of high net worth individuals and the families investing in Hong Kong. Let's see. Okay. So 
So we all know that aging population is a global phenomenon. In 2020, there were over 727 million people aged over 65. And according to United Nations statistics, this number is projected to double to 1.5 billion in 2050. So it means that one in six people in the world will be age 65 or above, and currently it's one in 11 people. Zooming into Hong Kong, we can see from government statistics on the right side that the number of persons aged 65 or above will jump from 18% in 2019 to 31% of the total population in 2039, which is a huge jump in just 20 years' time. Dementia is also a global phenomenon. It is a deterioration of the cognitive functioning of the brain, affecting, amongst other things, the ability to make complex decisions and interferes with our daily activities. Currently, there are 50 million people around the world with dementia, and we expect to see 10 million new cases every year. In Hong Kong, the number of persons aged 60 or above with dementia will more than triple from over 100,000 cases in 2009 to over 300,000 cases in 2039. So we need to be aware of the physical, psychological, social, and economic impacts, not only for the dementia patients, but for their carers, families, and society at large. We should also note that uh, from the experts that the life expectancy for men will increase to 85.6 and 91.3. Now, in this next slide, uh, we will see the increase uh, in the high net worth individuals in Hong Kong. Um, as mentioned by Joseph and Chi Men earlier, uh, in 2018, the number of high net worth individuals in Hong Kong reached over 150,000, with a total net worth value of US dollars 778 billion. And Hong Kong is ranked second globally, just behind New York in terms of the number of billionaires. So with a rapidly aging population, the surge of dementia cases, and substantial increase of private wealth and longevity, it is not surprising that the number of disputes between family members on private wealth and mental capacity issues are also on the rise. So what are the common issues faced by families with wealth? You can see on the slide I've listed out five. The vulnerability of aged wealth owners who are easy targets for financial abuse, memory lapse and asset management risks, the lack of mental capacity. We often hear stories of patriarchs or matriarchs forgetting to whom they transferred their assets or where their assets are located, often resulting in disputes on mental capacity or allegations of improper dealings in family businesses. Fairness and equality of gift distributions. Even though fairness does not uh, always mean equality. But from my experience in helping families with succession planning, unequal distribution in estate planning is certainly a recipe for disputes. And then also how to preserve family legacy and cater the desires for the younger generation is often very challenging for wealthy families with um, cross generations. So what is mental capacity? And what legal support is available in Hong Kong to help those facing these issues? Mental capacity refers to the mental competence or decision-making ability of an individual. Um, it is important to note that mental capacity is presumed. It is task-specific and time-specific. So if you look at the questions on this slide, um, it's relevant to us professionally and personally. What will happen if a CEO or an MD of a company loses his or her mental capacity? What can we do if, a, if an aged wealth owner is suddenly hospitalized during the middle of a property sale? How should banks and financial institutions handle transactions by vulnerable clients? The relevant legal framework is in Hong Kong dealing with these uh, capacity issues is the Mental Health Ordinance, CAP 136, which took effect in 1962. Part two of the ordinance provides for the management of the property and financial affairs of a person who, after being certified by doctors uh, that they are unable to manage their financial affairs, will a committee will be appointed to act on their behalf. Usually, family members are appointed. 
but in highly contentious cases or where there is an alleged improper dealing of family assets, an independent professional committee, usually consisting of lawyers or um, accountants, will be appointed. Uh, the part 4B of the ordinance deals with uh, the uh, appointment of a guardian by the guardianship board to manage the medical and uh, personal welfare of persons without mental capacity. The next piece of legislation is the Enduring Powers of Attorney Ordinance, which was enacted in 1997. Now, we all know that uh, the general powers of attorneys become invalid when the donor or maker loses his or her mental capacity. However, an enduring power of attorney provides that that power given to the attorney will survive or remain valid even after the donor or maker becomes mentally incapacitated, hence the word enduring. So um, on this slide, I would also like to highlight the legal services required for private, by private wealth clients. Similar to a corporate life cycle, here is a family life cycle. So you can see that from every stage, private wealth lawyers uh, provide a full cycle of legal services to provide and support to the families of high net worth individuals. Similar to a family doctor, we provide legal professional advice from cradle to grave, such as advising on prenuptial agreements um, and other aspects of family matrimonial law, wealth and succession planning, which often involves our tax um, and trust experts, estate and uh, mental t capacity disputes. We also advise uh, on clients on making wills, uh, enduring power of attorneys, etc., and also charities and philanthropy work. Now, what are the common uh, disputes uh, involving vulnerable persons? So um, exclusion uh, of an adult child from uh, management of a family business, unequal distribution of gift under a will. Um, it often results in uh, adult sibling rivalry and family tension. Also um, perceived unfair intervivors gifts made when a person is of advanced age or other inheritance uh, claims. I would like to now share with you uh, one of the case studies. Uh, it was mentioned by uh, Secretary for Justice in her opening remark. Uh, this case involves a typical Chinese family that built their wealth from trading and manufacturing business in the 1960s. The patriarch of the family died in 2018, leaving his wife and four children residing in different parts of the world. He did not make a will, uh, and leaving 50% of his entire wealth to his elderly wife, who was, in her, who was in her 80s. She became mentally incapacitated before she was able to complete the probate of a late husband, leaving most of the assets unadministered. The two eldest sons of the family were residing in North America for many years, and the younger siblings stayed in Hong Kong and were involved in the family business. After the father passed away, the older siblings returned to Hong Kong and discovered that the mother had in the interim transferred some money and property to the younger siblings by way of a deed of gift. So the issues in dispute are set out here, which includes the mental capacity of the mother, the care and financial arrangements for mother, and who will continue to operate the father's business, who will continue to administer the father's estate, and the validity of the deed of gift, etc. So the older siblings commence litigation against the younger siblings, and initially the relationship between them was very hostile. However, the two camps eventually agreed to use mediation to identify the underlying issues and concerns, one of which was the mistrust and the lack of transparency in the operation of father's business in Hong Kong and Shenzhen, and to explore common goals and encourage dialogue to facilitate intergenerational views. In the end, Mediation was successful to assist the parties to focus on the common goal, which was to look after the best interest of mother first, and created um, options uh, in settling the claims, which involved third generation family members to take part in the running of family business, and also the drafting of a family constitution, which defined the management of family business and ownership of family assets. A clear timetable and roadmap was set to achieve a win-win situation. Now, the next case is uh, in a judgment delivered July 2020 involving Mr. Chow, 
a very successful business and founder of an international conglomerate uh, business in the 1970s. Mr. Chow passed away in 2018, leaving his wife and seven children surviving him. Three years before he passed away, Mr. Chow made various gifts of money and property to some of his children. Later the same month, um, he also uh, made a will. Uh, uh, three, in the same month, he made a will giving all his Lisco shares to his fifth daughter and the residuary estate to his wife and other, or other daughters, but not the son. Not very typical in Hong Kong. Um, the number one sister challenged the testamentary capacity of the father when making the said will. So when the fifth daughter witnessed the expression of discontent by the elder sister, she voluntarily gave an undertaking to transfer all the shares to set up a child family trust for the benefit of all the children, including her mother and brother. So in cases where there is actual or perceived unequal distribution of assets under a will, mediation should be encouraged to help families resolve all or some of the issues in dispute in a private and less adversarial setting, which is more conducive to preserving family relationships and harmony. So I would like to conclude by re-emphasizing the advantages of mediation as an alternative dispute resolution in Hong Kong. The mediation ordinance uh, enacted in 2013 has the objective of promoting, encouraging, and facilitating resolution of disputes and to protect the confidential nature of these mediate, mediation communications. And as you can see from the cases that I shared, mediation helps resolve family disputes, especially if mediation is used uh, at an early intervention to prevent these family disputes from escalating into high conflict disputes, attracting unnecessary media and public attention. It also helps to preserve family wealth and to encourage intergenerational communication, thereby restoring family relationships and family legacy. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sharon, for sharing with us all those interesting data on the aging population, uh, which is indicative of uh, demand for wealth management services arising out of that, and also for sharing with us your views on the legal framework uh, in Hong Kong, particularly to provide such services, and the types of disputes, a very interesting uh, case studies that you have uh, raised, and also the use of mediation uh, to help resolve dispute of, the, of, of this type. Um, uh, I, have, I have at least two questions for you, but then I'll save it till the last, uh, which, which would be, uh, quite uh, 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 particular, particularly for type of dispute suitable to use mediation to resolve dispute. I think, I think I'll, I'll raise the questions with you later on. So last but not least, uh, we are, whilst we're on a topic of talking about dispute resolution and wealth management, um, our speaker, last speaker, Mr. Dick Ta Yi, who is chairman of our Financial Dispute Resolution Center, uh, he is going to tell us a bit more about uh, what the uh, FDLC does and what kind of services FDLC would offer to uh, 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 clients who might have disputes arising out of financial uh, investments. Dieter, Thank you, time Tom is yours. Thank you, Thomas. Um, uh, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Dieter Yi. Uh, I'm appearing today in my capacity as chairman of the uh, Financial Dispute Resolution Center. Um, the FDLC, um, well, I was, going to, uh, I was going to talk to you about um, generally uh, the difference between mediation, arbitration, and litigation, but you all have covered that already. And most of you, I suspect online or, or who are present here will know the distinction. So uh, half of what I'm going to talk about uh, has been cut off. Um, so we, we will finish this quickly. Uh, I will jump straight into telling you something about uh, the FDLC. Um, the FDLC uh, is, a, um, uh, uh, is a key component uh, of Hong Kong's financial regulatory 
and investor protection regime. The most important point, uh, most important key factor uh, for Hong Kong's financial regulatory regime is the public policy objective of investor protection. Um, and the FDRC is a key component of that. You, when you talk about uh, investor protection, you have the frontline investor protection by the regulators, the SFC, the Monetary Authority, uh, the Insurance Authority, and, and, and so on. Uh, but what happens if something goes wrong and people resort to litigation? Uh, and in recent years, we are actively pushing and encouraging mediation and arbitration. Um, the FDLC is a non-profit company with money ceded from the Hong Kong government, the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, and the Securities and Futures Commission. The, I the idea of the FDLC is to help resolve monetary disputes between financial institutions uh, and their individual customers. The FDLC administers what we call the FDRS, which is the Financial Dispute resolution scheme. Now, allow me to uh, put in a five seconds commercial plug. Uh, the uh, FDRS uh, is an independent, affordable, accessible, efficient, and transparent channel for financial institutions and their individual customers to resolve their monetary disputes by way of mediation first, arbitration next. The aim is to have a very efficient and simple system where customers can resolve their disputes and issues with the um, financial institutions concerned. So when we talk about financial institutions, the members of this FDRS scheme would be financial institutions authorized or licensed by the Hong Kong Monetary Authority or the SFC. The only exception are those only providing credit rating services. Uh, credit rating agencies need to be registered uh, and licensed by the SFC, but uh, they are not financial institutions uh, with a customer relationship uh, in the sense that we, we know about. Um, financial institutions, when they have claims uh, of amounts one million or below, uh, they have to go through uh, the FDRS. Whereas the individual customers, if they have a claim, if they have a claim against the financial institutions, they do not necessarily need to go through the FDRS, but they are encouraged to use the FDRS because of the efficiency and the cost effectiveness. The maximum amount of claim is one million, as I said, and they are monetary claims. So if you have, um, uh, if uh, uh, investors have a problem with um, non-compliance or breach of policies or uh, uh, misrepresentations, those matters will probably be a complaint to the regulators. But the regulators cannot deal with monetary losses. They do not deal with monetary losses. They do not award compensations. And so schemes like the FDRS will help take care of that. The FDRS also have a, uh, a limitation uh, of 24 months uh, from the date uh, the, a product is purchased or when a loss is first recognized, uh, whichever is the lower. Now, that one, we talked about the 1 million limit. We talked about this 24 months uh, time limit. Both of that can be uh, extended or increased uh, when um, uh, consented by both parties. Uh, we talked about um, mediation and arbitration. Mediation first, arbitration second. Uh, that is uh, uh, the uh, uh, collaborative problem-solving way to discuss and find ways to resolve disputes with an aim to a win-win situation. The FDRS scheme has uh, 100 uh, mediator and arbitrator on the list that can help uh, with, uh, with this process. Being qualified uh, as the mediator or arbitrator of the FDRS is not an easy task. Um, uh, I know because I, I went through that recently myself. 
um, uh, and uh, the uh, the test uh, when I when I took it was that you need an 80% pass mark. So it is not an easy it is not an easy test to go through. Um, features of the FDRS, um, the processing time, the advantage of the F FDRS is that the process processing time from start to finish is very short. When we actually uh, decide on who the mediator is under a mediation case, the, um, uh, the, the matter is usually dealt with within 21 days of the mediator being appointed. So within three weeks of him being appointed, there are active discussions that goes on, and usually a high number of cases, 21 days, uh, you reach a settlement or you find out that you cannot settle. Um, with an arbitration case, it's usually within one month of the receipt of the last document or the in-person hearing. Uh, we found that experience tells us that um, uh, the FDRS is actually very successful. The overall successful mediation rate is 83%. There has been a slight drop in 2020, um, uh, probably due to uh, COVID cases, uh, but um, uh, uh, we have an overall satisfaction rate, which is also very high. Um, and a little bit of number here as well. Uh, the, uh, 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 for the cases that we handle, over 80% of the cases that we handle are mediation cases. 20%, uh, the rest would be arbitration cases. Now, let's talk about money. Uh, I talked about the FDRS being uh, affordable. It is uh, affordable. Uh, for mediation, there is a cap in the fee that uh, we charge, uh, including the mediator, is 20,000 Hong Kong. For arbitration, the maximum cost to be paid by the financial institution would be 32,500 Hong Kong. And for the customer, would be 17,500. So it's, it's much cheaper to use the uh, dispute resolution uh, services of the FDLC than to go to your lawyer. I'm sorry, uh, guys, um, um, for all the lawyers sitting around here. Um, but, um, uh, 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 but, but despite us charging so cheap, 90% uh, of our users actually rates FDLC services as satisfactory or higher. And usually it's actually higher than satisfactory. Okay. Uh, benefits of the, FD, uh, of the FDRS. Um, there are quite a few benefits, but um, uh, we talked about this being a trusted and accessible cost-efficient way uh, to seek redress for your monetary disputes. For financial institutions, uh, there are, uh, there's also the advantage of the matter avoiding substantial dragged-out uh, litigation with the clients. Uh, therefore saving costs. Um, and it's also a mechanism that increases uh, your customers' um, confidence uh, and uh, appetite to deal with you going forward. Uh, so we consider that uh, this, um, uh, uh, the business community in Hong Kong should be encouraged to take up uh, the um, uh, FDRS when they set up in Hong Kong. Uh, just a little bit of uh, uh, side uh, information about uh, COVID arrangements. Um, uh, the alternative methods of hearing uh, uh, proceedings, uh, we are moving to online. Uh, and so uh, since the, uh, April of 2020, our mediation matters are handled online. Um, most of the arbitration uh, matters uh, are dealt with actually by paper. Uh, it's a paper arbitration, uh, but you can also request uh, online and in-person hearing. So um, uh, with that, um, I will conclude, uh, and um, uh, I want to encourage everybody who's interested in family wealth uh, management to, and private wealth management to uh, set up in Hong Kong and think about Hong Kong as your desirable place to do business. Thank you. Thank you, Dita. Thank you so much for giving us uh, an interesting introduction of FDRC and what it works, particularly FDRS. I'm sure that we have uh, questions for you.
And now uh, we do have uh, quite a bit of time for our Q&A. Um, so maybe, uh, is, that, is that an iPad that you would give me? You don't mind, um, uh, since uh, we are still, uh, we just finished the FDLC uh, topic, maybe uh, I'll ask a question uh, about FDLC. Um, uh, Dita, just now you talk about uh, mediation, the, the, the whole procedure uh, that FDLC used to resolve dispute. Mediation first 21 days, if I remember correctly, and arbitration one month. So, it is, so is it roughly? There is a time limit within which, once you get the claim, you need to resolve it within roughly two months. Is that a correct uh, estimate? Yes, that that's a correct that that's correct assumption. Although, I think practically speaking, uh, when uh, uh, when let's say a, a, a claimant comes to us and say, "I have a case uh, and I've got a problem. I've got a complaint with certain uh, financial institutions." we will assess whether or not the case is something that is the force under the FERS. Right. And then we will uh, contact the uh, financial institution concerned. Uh, the, and then we will then offer uh, a number of uh, mediators uh, for the uh, clients to go and choose. Uh, as a result of that, the 21 days will start the moment when both parties agree to who the mediator should be. Right. And then we'll, 21 days will start to count. Typically, and, and, and quite, um, it will be quite out of the ordinary if a matter is not resolved within three months. Right. For arbitration, it's slightly longer because there is document discovery stage. So probably the most longest case that we probably have would be six months. So do, do you have any figures to share with us uh, around the number of cases handled over the past year or the past two years? Uh, the past two years, uh, the numbers has not been uh, very high, surprisingly. Mm. Mm. Um, uh, we would have uh, imagined that uh, the uh, COVID would have caused uh, a number of more claims coming up, but it's been steady. Uh, for 2020, uh, we have 35 cases that came to uh, the FDLC uh, that were accepted uh, and it's uh, uh, proceeded, uh, processed. Uh, 2021, uh, up till the end of last month, uh, we had 32. Right. So I'm anticipating we will close this year probably with 50. Right, okay. Thank you, thank you, Dieter. Now, now I would like to turn to uh, have a question for uh, Joel. Um, now in your... Uh, uh, topic that you talked about, uh, you, you mentioned about the popularity and accessibility of the Hong Kong Stock Exchange uh, uh, as a preferred listing venue for companies uh, looking to raise funds in the capital markets. Um, can, uh, are you able to elaborate a bit more about uh, what listing a company on the stock exchange can mean for family offices looking to exit uh, their pre-IPO investments by way of an IPO? Okay. so. Um, typically, when you have family offices or, or, or um, high net worth individuals investing in companies, um, and they're looking to exit that by way of, by an, of an initial public offering, um, whether they are a minority investor or whether they are the majority controlling shareholder investor, um, typically, I mean, what's most important for these these exiting investors or shareholders would be the certainty of, of, of success of, of their transaction. So the benefit of listing in Hong Kong, um, I would sort of generally categorize it into two categories, um, the process and the marketability. So in terms of the process, um, the Hong Kong listing regime has a very, very clear framework and a very clear set of rules. You know, beyond the securities laws, the Hong Kong listing rules, you know, you have your, your um, gui guidance letters, your practice notes, you know, your, regulator your regular updates from the stock exchange on, on, on um, transactions that were successful, transactions that were rejected. So, so um, companies looking to list in Hong Kong can expect a very clear and transparent process. 
Um, beyond that, it's also a very, very fair process. You know, whether you're the biggest IPO in history or if you're an, a, a company making wigs that's, you know, looking to IPO, um, companies will be treated fairly and equally um, by the regulators in their listing process. And, and lastly, in terms of process, I think the most important factor would be efficiency. Um, typically, from the time of the submission of the application to the completion of the IPO, it's usually sort of never more than um, six months. It could be as short as four months, you know, if your listing application is, is well prepared. So there's this sort of um, level of efficiency that, that, that um, one can expect if, if you're looking to exit your pre-IPO investment in Hong Kong. And then in terms of um, marketability, I think that's sort of probably the more important factor. You have in Hong Kong, you know, a, a global market that's accessible by everyone around the world. You know, you have prospectuses that are published in both English and, and Chinese. Um, and also the sort of the, the, the banking system and the securities clearing system that is world class. So with that, I think um, for, for family offices and private wealth investors, when they're looking to sort of exit through an IPO, um, Hong Kong is a very, very attractive venue. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. Um, the next question that I have is, is for Sh Sharon. Uh, Sherlyn, um, now, the, on, on the two very interesting case studies that you mentioned about, you know, very complicated family uh, tree and disputes, you know, as a result of the estate uh, uh, rising out of it. Now, uh, we, we have seen uh, over the years uh, family disputes f being fought over tens of years, right, uh, with no success or with no conclusion. Now, you just suggested that mediation is a way out. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I want to know more about it because uh, uh, we, when I, I learned mediation many years ago, people were telling me, oh, not all disputes are suitable for mediation. Maybe family dispute or disputes that cannot be resolved 100% by payment of money. Uh, I think somebody was telling me, all right? There are disputes that you cannot just resolve by paying, agreeing to pay a certain sum of money. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's because of emotional value, there's things like that. Those are more suitable for mediation. Now, I, I would like to hear from you. What, what do you think about that? Well, I think um, family mediation or family wealth mediation is actually uh, very important. And I think it works, it's works because um, it's actually family. They all have common goals. Um, and um, it all arises, I think, from a lot of um, adult sibling rivalry or what I mentioned about perceived um, unequal, you know, unfairness and uh, lack of transparency. But actually, it, it builds up, right, from all over. It, it involves the emotions. It's not just about money. In fact, I have a case where it doesn't really make sense, but it's still ongoing. But um, the reason is because it's something that happened probably in childhood or whether, you know, the, uh, the father uh, favored, uh, I heard you've yeah, got yeah. several children, so, you know, you favor one over the other I and it, you don't favor them, <laughs> okay. <laughs> then um, you actually, that actually builds up. And so when it becomes full blown, sometimes it's very, very difficult. But all the more, I think it's important uh, for the uh, mediation to come in because um, as, a, as a mediator, I feel like it's, it's actually very, for me, it's, uh, it's got a sort of satisfaction when I can gather 10 siblings uh, on one occasion to sit down and actually explore. You know, would, if your mother, in, in a case where like it's mental capacity mm. dispute, so the, the parent or the mother or the father is still alive, you ask them, you know, would your father or mother want to see all this happening, all this money thrown in, three sets of litigations, you know, everyone's suing everyone. Um, and then it does come to a point where it becomes, uh, it becomes uh, very heartwarming to see them sort of break the ice and, and um, because one sibling said something that happened 30 years ago. But these are some of the things, it's not just about money. And I think um, because mediation is um, confidential and um, a lot of times um, they are able to, um, be able to uh, sit sit round and just talk, but of course we <laughs> we have to be very careful um, not uh, because of the emotions. Sometimes you know one word can uh, trigger uh, a lot of uh, emotions, and so I think as a mediator, it, it's it's actually quite tough 
being a family private wealth mediator mm. because you also it's not just about um, how much money is involved or what the contract says here. So I, I really agree with uh, the fact that um, you know family mediation or um, used in these private wealth because most of the time it goes back to family. You know, it's still a whole one family and um, they have a lot of common goals. So when I, um, early intervention is um, if you can with all the family offices in Hong Kong, um, if we can add the mediate first clause mm. in the family constitution, mm. I think that would be very, very um, helpful because then it will be mediation first. And then um, before the um, dispute escalates, I think if someone is there to gather the people around the table and find out the common concerns, that actually helps transparency you know, um, long-term planning. Thank you. So your suggestion is that, you know, uh, put a mediation first clause into in the, the family office constitution. Yeah, that's so one thing. Yeah. But if it's not there or if there's no family constitution and there's already litigation, I think it's also very important to pull them into mediation earlier to see if we can thank, uh, resolve Thank you. It. Thank you, Sherlyn. Sherlyn. Now, back to you, um, uh, Dita. Um, now, you... you, you you mentioned about it's interesting. Uh, I was looking at the uh, the uh, FDRS uh, uh, scheme, uh, uh, one million dollar, right? Now, is there any specific requirements? For example, uh, customers. You know, you, you say one 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 side is financial institution, the other side is customer. A uh, customer does it mean it only need to be? It, it must be an individual, or does it include corporate? Or is there, is there a Hong Kong residence requirement uh, in order to qualify them to use this uh, system? Can, can, a, can a foreign investors, for example, somebody who, bought, who buy the product from a mainlanders, can they use this scheme? Okay, uh, many questions in one, mm -hmm. but uh, I'll quickly answer that. Uh, number one, that one million uh, threshold can be increased by agreement between the two parties. And parties frequently agree that because they see that process as a quick process of dealing with the disputes. Uh, we've also been talking about whether or not we should increase that, but, but um, uh, a lot of people come to us uh, with the agreement that they will, they will let FDRS handle that dispute even if it is over one million. Uh, the, the second point is, does it apply only to individuals? No, it doesn't apply only to individuals. Uh, for the customers, it could be an individual customer a sole proprietorship business, or what we call the um, small enterprises. Small enterprises, actually, it's got a bigger definition. It's about 50 million in annual revenue mm. or 50 million in assets. Mm. So uh, uh, it, it is, uh, uh, so co corporates can, you can be the claimant mm. uh, in this regard. Um, and you talked about whether or not uh, 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 people who are not resident in Hong Kong can use it. Yes, uh, the product has to be obviously uh, dealt with with the financial institutions. The financial institutions themselves are in Hong Kong, and so uh, we frequently uh, accept um, uh, uh, applications uh, to handle mediation and arbitration uh, from uh, uh, from claimants who are not resident in Hong Kong. We typically get, uh, at the moment get quite a number of cases from the GBA. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, D Dieter. Uh, I actually still have two questions, uh, but I, I have just been shown that uh, we are running out of time, so. Um, okay, all right, okay, good, good, good. Now, another question from the, f uh, from the uh, uh, iPad is for uh, Joel. Uh, a question that, uh, as a legal practitioner in Hong Kong, uh, you are the IPO expert, right? Uh, somebody want your advice, how to grab the GBA opportunities in the capital market? Well, um, so capital markets is quite a sort of a, a, a wide definition. You know, we, we talk a lot about um, listing of securities in, in Hong Kong, IPOs, um, but capital market itself also encompasses um, debt um, instruments. So, you know, things like your bonds, you know, warrants. So with the sort of um, the new um, Wealth Connect that connects um, um, Hong Kong to Macau and to the Chinese market. It allows investors in any of these three jurisdictions to start sort of investing in 
in financial products, which sort of would encompass securities, which is already covered by covered by Stock Connect, and and your debt and other financial instruments that are marketed through banks. So um, you can sort of imagine it like a similar bigger. Um, um, system um, like Stock Connect, but it would encompass other financial products, mm. and that would sort of allow um, investors in any of these um, three three um, jurisdictions to to cross invest across borders. Thank you, thank you, Joel. Okay, last questions for uh, Sherilyn about the enduring power of attorney. It's very okay. interesting, but I, I'm just thinking whilst we're on the topic of GBA, if we're looking at the GBA market where you have uh, old people, for example, in GBA and they have assets around in mainland Hong Kong, they want to use the uh, enduring power of attorney mechanism to protect them. Uh, uh, how, is it possible for them to, do they have to execute it in Hong Kong or can they have similar instrument in China or do they, do they need Hong Kong lawyers to, to help them do that? So if we have um, uh, some of the lawyers, some of the uh, cases that we get from uh, the, you're talking about the assets being in Hong Kong, well, assets around in GBA right. areas, including Hong Kong and mainland China, but the person probably is in GBA, okay. not necessarily in so Hong Kong. For, so in cases where uh, the uh, enduring power of attorney uh, has to be uh, executed in uh, Hong Kong mm. uh, because of the two, uh, well, it has to be witnessed by the, uh, the lawyer mm. with a practicing certificate, as well as a doctor with a medical uh, registered medical certificate mm. in Hong Kong. I think there'll be some development in this area of law later because of uh, COVID and you know we're talking about video witnessing mm -hmm. and things like that. But just at the moment, uh, we are still bound by that. But um, say there was no uh, EPA uh, in, in, I have a recent case mm. where the uh, person has assets in Hong Kong but is now in mainland mm. and then is mentally incapacitated mm. and did not, uh, did not uh, have any, mm. execute any uh, enduring power of attorney. So um, in mainland, they have, uh, they have obtained a uh, similar order uh, in like a committee order mm. for the parent or family members to uh, act for the uh, manage the affairs uh, of the MIP. However, um, they have to register that order in Hong Kong mm. in order for the banking institutions or other, um, uh, other wh wherever the assets are uh, to be able to um, recognize that. And so there is a provision in Hong Kong in the legislation where that uh, for foreign similar orders to be registered in Hong Kong. So that can also be and done. And be able to uh, manage the right. assets in Hong Kong. Thank you so much, Sharon. I think we are now running out of time. And thank you all for listening. And thank you. Join me to thank the panel of speakers for the excellent presentation and our Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you so much, Thomas. Thank you to our panelists for the amazing discussion. Thank you. Please return to your seats. Thank you for the enlightening, for the insightful and interesting discussion of legal supports to the private wealth management sector. I believe everyone had a great time, and I wish this webinar has given you a much clearer understanding about the private wealth management sector in Hong Kong and the legal services related to private wealth management Hong Kong has to offer, and most importantly, how they facilitate Hong Kong to be a private wealth management hub. This is a very meaningful topic to look deeper into. Now we are honored to have Mr. Stephen Phillips, Director General of Invest Hong Kong, to present us with the closing remarks. Stephen, please. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for that. Um, my responsibility is really to draw to a close our discussions this afternoon. Um, I'm very conscious it's the end of the day here in Hong Kong, and I'm sure for many of you online as well. So I'll try and keep my remarks short. Um, firstly, I'd like to thank our two keynote speakers, the Secretary for Justice and the Under Secretary for Financial Services and the Treasury, and our amazing panelists who really have taken us through the whole waterfront um, of asset management, wealth management here in Hong Kong, from gestation through to the um, dispute resolution. Um, so I think we've had an incredibly rich discussion, um, really, really rich content and some fantastic insights from all of our professionals. Um, I think when we started this afternoon, we set out to tackle private wealth management in Hong Kong the best option. 
Um, obviously, I leave it to each member of the audience to decide whether we've proven that point. Um, but I think that our panelists have given us lots of ammunition um, to make that case. So I think it's proven. Looking to the future, um, whether you're a family office um, or whether you're a lawyer, accountant, um, financial services provider, if you would like more information about what Hong Kong could mean for your business, please feel free to contact my colleagues either in our family office Hong Kong team or our financial services team or professional services team at Invest Hong Kong. Our job is to help you identify the opportunities for your business in the city and then help you seize those opportunities along the way. And I'm sure that our speakers um, and all of the organizations um, who have been involved this afternoon will also extend their support. So it really just remains for me once again to thank all of our speakers. I particularly want to thank the fantastic crew, the team that has made this all happen. There's lots of people who haven't been um, in the camera shot, who've done lots of great work, both in the preparation and execution of the event this afternoon. But most of all, if I could thank all of you for joining us today. I hope you found it informative. I know that I did. And if we can help at Invest Hong Kong or Family Office Hong Kong, that's what we would love to do. So thank you very much indeed, and have a super evening. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephen. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope all of you enjoyed today's event. Thank you once again for your participation and support of this webinar. Have a nice evening. Thank you so much. <laughs>